the uh, the third and final day of um, public hearings for some appeals to the Commission's inquiry into Victoria Racing Club Limited's performances on Christmas Day in 2020. Um, I'm just here on Press Day as a detailed participant and to present the evidence from the Commission on Crime and from SA. Um, before we get underway, first I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional track owners of the land on which we live today, the Kalbal and Dagera people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Now, as I suggested, today is the last day of our um, hearing that we have on Christmas Day in 2020. Um, this is all about the Kalbal and Dagera people and Dagera property. Um, I'd like to ask them to come forward and tell us a little bit about their life. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little logistic matter and then I'll talk a little bit about why we have hearings. Um, if fire alarms go off, <laughs> <laughs> have some common sense. <laughs> Head out the door and find another door to get out of the building and follow someone with a stage door next time. <laughs> Don't take the risk. Right, done that. Okay, so why do we have public hearings? Um, public hearings are a really important part of our consultation process. Um, unlike many other organisations, we can um, put out a draft report and let everybody pick the prize on it. So you can tell us what we got right, what we got wrong and what we missed altogether. We're kind of hoping, now that we're at stage three of, um, of the inquiry process here, that we, we haven't missed anything, but I think um, we still need to get evidence base from people where they may disagree with where we're heading or where they think we could do things differently or better. Um, a full transcript is being taken, and we are live streaming this event on YouTube, uh, which means we can't take questions from the floor. Um, so the transcript, the transcript itself that's being recorded today will go up on our website um, afterwards, but people can jump online and see the, the, um, the YouTubies of, uh, of the filming. Um, participants may make opening remarks of no more than five minutes. The baby's bell will sound. Um, and you're not required to take an oath. We're the um, not-so-royal commission, but we simply just ask that you be truthful. Um, media rules do apply, um, so please identify yourself to one of our wonderful staff members if you are uh, gentlefolk from the media. Um, no video or audio recording for broadcast purposes past the opening remarks can be made by the media, but we're going live with YouTube, thus nobody wants to do that anymore anyway. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite our first participants um, uh, who have joined us from the Financial Services Council. Thank you very much for joining us today, for travelling to make our hearings today. Um, if you could each just state your name and organisation just for voice recognition purposes for the transcript, and then if you'd like to make some brief opening remarks, that'd be appreciated. Uh, Jane McNamara, Financial Services Council. Uh, Alan Hansel, Director of Policy and Global Markets, Financial Services Council. Michael Potter, Financial Services Council. Nick Kerwin, Financial Services Council. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, the, uh, the Financial Services Council would like to thank the Commission for the opportunity to give evidence here today. And uh, we, com we commend you um, for a comprehensive draft report with many sensible and well-considered recommendations. We welcome the Commission's comments that the superannuation system is working well for most members. That being said, there are still too many members that, are, that the current default system fails to protect from poor outcomes. We agree that more can be done to ensure all Australians are well served by the default superannuation system and strongly support all ideas for improvement um, to be fully explored. <coughs> there are many elements of the Commission's report that we wholeheartedly support. <coughs> the Financial Services Council has long advocated for decoupling the default system from the industrial relations system to give consumers greater control. We also welcome the proposal to prevent consumers ending up with multiple accounts by providing a default once mechanism. This would work alongside the recently introduced government legislation to clean up multiple accounts through consolidation of inactive accounts and those with low balances via an ATO sweep. FSC members also support greater transparency, better disclosure and strong governance in all aspects of superannuation. There is no place in a compulsory system for consistent underperformers and the FSC welcomes the Commission's strong condemnation of funds which refuse to merge when it is in the best interests of members. Whatever the fund stripes, the ones that generate poor outcomes for members should shape up, ship out, or merge with better performing players. The FSC also agrees with the Commission that high quality and comparable data that is meaningful for consumers should also be made available. The design of such a product dashboard should take learnings from behavioural economics and aim to be neither too simplistic nor too complex. 
which of course is no easy task. FSC members are confident they would be able to compete under the best in show shortlist approach recommended by the Commission and submit that this approach is an improvement on the status quo. However, in considering this proposal, our members have questioned why you would limit the shortlist to 10 funds. We need to very carefully think through the potential unintended consequences and market distortions that can flow from what will be a fundamental redesign of the system. We share the view of others who have appeared in these hearings in asking how a truly independent expert panel would be selected. As long as super remains partisan, this cannot be guaranteed. Could suitable raising of the bar for my super authorisation by APRA be another way of achieving best in show on its own? The Commission has undertaken a significant data collection initiative in preparing this report. We are still working with our members to review the Commission's analysis and will provide more detailed fe feedback as part of our submission. Ultimately, we believe the Commission has identified clear policy problems with the superannuation system and a policy framework that might address these. There will need to be significant work done to understand how the proposed default system would operate and how it will impact consumer outcomes over the long term. And the FSC looks forward to working with you <coughs> uh, on these matters. Great. Thank you very much, Alan, for those opening remarks. Um, we might start first with a Bernie Fraser quote, if I may. Um, the, the problems that the Productivity Commission have identified have been there for yonks, but there has been a hell of a lot of inertia. I guess it does sort of beg the question, why hasn't the industry done something before now about the two problems that we identified in our report of unintended multiple accounts and systemic persistent underperformance? Um, well, I guess one of the things is part of it is not actually caused by the industry, it's caused by the default system. Uh, so. Um, it's not entirely the industry's fault, I would submit. Okay, so I can understand that, Michael, maybe for unintended multiple accounts, um, but persistent underperformance. Um, well, I, hmm, there are a range of issues there with underperformance. Um, we're not entirely comfortable with the Commission's analysis, so we, we are doing some work with our members on looking at the analysis of the data. Um, but, I mean, uh, naturally, when you've got a, an average and a dispersion around that average, you're always going to have some funds which are above and some which are below. The question about the ones are below, are, is that caused by um, systemic problems, for example, lack of scale, which is a problem that you have identified. Um, so that's just something which I think we need to be working through, and I understand that you're working through this as well. You haven't, um, you're going to be finalising some work on looking at economies of scale and the effect that that has. That would be an example of something which is systemic to the industry, but is also part of it just because you have a distribution around an average. Um, yeah. Well, it's not really a distribution around an average, so with the poor, and that's what was the, for us, um, uh, that the beauty of the portfolio benchmarks is it's not an average of the system. It's actually, uh, and indeed we, we benefited very much in stage one from having the technical round table, and there's even a few people in, in this room who helped us out of that technical round table, um, by being able to um, create an individual portfolio benchmark by system, segment, fund and product, that means what's your value add? So it's nearly like a performance attribution analysis. So we take the given a strategic asset allocation. If you've persistently underperformed that benchmark over 12 years by 25 basis points or more, which we thought was kind of generous, that's not a normal distribution. That's persistent underperformance. A distribution around an average is, is that. That's not what this is. Mm. So we haven't had anyone suggest to us that... Anyway, we'll... So in terms of the methodology that we've taken around the portfolio benchmarks, is, is that the question mark that you've got? Look, some of our members have raised that issue. Um, we can't make a definitive statement of our position on this right at the moment. We're still working that through with our members. Okay. So the FSC does or doesn't accept that there is evidence of persistent underperformance? As I said in my opening statement, um, clearly um, underperformance is not acceptable and for those funds that are underperforming, they need to shape up or ship out. So okay. I say we, we do accept there is underperformance. Okay. Um, the question is uh -huh. about how you measure that and who it, who it is applying to. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, and indeed going forward we've suggested that the regulator would actually use the portfolio benchmark approach to help with an elevated my super, mm. but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and we do appreciate that, um, that FSC is now on the record supporting in general terms um, 
the architectural changes um, that we're looking at. Let's look at unintended multiple accounts first. Um, so I take it from your opening remarks that you are supportive of the default once and then, mm -hmm. and unless a member chooses to go somewhere else, mm -hmm. that's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, that's one way of mopping up or stopping the creation of unintended multiple accounts and, and you were right in pointing out that the government has a lot of other initiatives underway that we welcome as well in terms of mopping up the, the existing legacy of unintended multiple accounts. The other model that's been suggested post the release of our draft report, and I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look or think about this, is the one of balanced rollover that's been suggested by Industry Super Australia, I think the ACTU and a couple of other folk from Melbourne. Um, that, so instead of stapling the member account to the member, every t and so the, that account follows the member through their working life, so that fund with that product follows them through their working life unless they choose to go to another one or unless that that bundle, that account loses my super authorization. They're recommending instead that the balance goes with the member. So you, you don't have the unintended, unintended multiple accounts, the balance rolls over wherever the member goes and whatever default product might apply to that award or that employment workplace. Are, are you aware that that's the other suggestion that's been put on the table? Uh, no, I'm not, but okay. I, I'd have to say that um, we, we, as I indicated in the opening statement, we're very supportive of the, of the Commission's finding that we should be moving away from the industrial relations system. And um, I think that uh, particular policy proposition tends to bring everything back into the industrial relations system such that it m mimics um, arrangements that are there at the moment or, or accepts those arrangements that are, that are there at the moment. Okay. Well, it would be helpful for us, and, and this is one of the reasons also why we decided to have hearings before post-draft report submissions, because it, it helps us to get issues covered in the post-draft report submissions. So it would be helpful for us for you to sort of test with your membership mm. the pros and cons of the, the two options. Yes. Uh, yep. We've already identified and we've heard from inquiry participants in Sydney and Melbourne some of the problems with the balance rollover. What do you do with someone with multiple jobs? Admin costs will be higher. A member, how can you have engagement with a fund if you're going to be having five or six funds during <coughs> your lifetime? Um, so it would be good for, for us to hear from yourselves, given that you represent a large part of the mm -hmm. industry, what your um, uh, membership think of that, that idea. Can I make one observation, which is that doesn't seem to be moving in a, in a customer or consumer-driven direction. It seems to be moving in, in an employer or employment driven direction mm. and we, we are, I, I don't think our members would be particularly keen on that, that direction of movement. Well that, I, I think that point's been made by others as well and mm. I think it is a good point mm. um, particularly by some behavioural economists and academics <laughs> but um, so we look forward to, to hearing back some more from you on your post-draft report submission. Um, so that then takes us to the, the, the best in show. Um, you raised an issue of, about the Y10 funds. Mm -hmm. um, Two reasons with the Y10 funds. One of them we knew before we went into the stage three inquiry, and that is that behavioural economics tells us that for members um, uh, in a world of compulsion and complexity, to be able to make simple and safer choice, about up to 10 works. And indeed, we tested that when we did our, um, our members' choice survey last year, uh, which we did, I think, with about 2,500. Um, consumers and of which I think about 278 were 15 to 19 year olds and lo and behold when we constructed a best in show sort of arrangement where they had the up to 10 95 percent of them could actually make a, a meaningful choice um, only five percent didn't make a choice so they would still stay in a world of default so that's the Y10 and then lo and behold we wanted to make sure that there was a competitive dynamic so if you chose a best in 10 and, and while investment performance is, is one of the principles there's a whole bunch of others if you looked at the distribution of performance, um, 10 looks about right as well in terms of creating that competitive dynamic every four years, um, if we're just looking at um, long run net investment performance. So that's the Y10, I hope that answers that part of your question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, we just re I just really touched on that in the opening statement, but um, as I said, we haven't really formulated our views yet mm -hmm. um, around this particular the subject, but I mean, some of the questions that we've had coming through sort of uh, delve a bit more deeply into that yep. uh, comment that I made earlier. Um, so, for example, what if you happen to find yourself as a member in a fund that's number 11 or 12 or 25 for that matter? Um, really, is that uh, are the differences in rankings between each of the funds at the higher end really that materially different um, for you to be sort of on the edges as opposed to in the top 10. Um, 
the other uh, question or, or observation that's being made is that uh, could this lead to um, to sort of members changing their own behaviours? So the the, um, the way it was put to me was that you may well have members swinging to the fences. So it's a sort of baseball analogy there, where they're trying to get the home run by following the top ten um, every four years. And is that really the sorts of behaviours that we want consumers to be um, exercising? Mm. Um, funds themselves might also adopt similar behaviours in that they will end up, or they may end up, um, trying to mimic the investment strategies of those in the top ten so that they can be in the top ten. Um, so I think there's there are a lot of sort of potentially unintended consequences that would come from um, restricting the list in that way and, and I think some, some thought needs to be around <laughs> how you would construct that. Okay. So let's talk about a few of those. So I think um, uh, with respect to those that are number 11 through to 25... Um, Sorry, that was just arbitrary. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and so we, 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 we'll keep the arbitrary metrics okay. for the moment and, and note that they are arbitrary. Um, with the 11 to 25, it's, it's a good thing that... Um, that they do want to make the top 10, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to inject a competitive dynamic for the default market, which is totally non-existent at the moment. So again, we're looking at it purely from the perspective of members, not the perspective of funds. It's only if there was a perverse consequence in fund behaviour that would harm members that we would be concerned. We've constructed it such that the, the way the best in show gets the keys to the kingdom, it's not keys to the entire kingdom, it's just the new job entrant money. So when you look at the, the metrics around the flows of contributions, that of which there's about $150 billion each year, only $1 billion in new job entrants, and then I think there's about another $2 billion that's um, some turnover, then there's uh, re-entrants and people returning to the workforce. So when you look at the churn in the system and the new job entrants, it's only about $19.7 billion of your $149.8 billion. So thus, that's what they're getting access to. So you'd need to assume an exponential uplift in switching rates to your best in show for it to really, over time, um, impact the, the cash flows um, in a detrimental sense that we'd be concerned by a good fund. I guess the other thing is we're also doing it in a world where you've got your 10 every four years um, and hopefully that 10 might change. Um, the behavioural economists that we've spoken to and some of the academics in this area don't see that there's a real risk of members being with the top 10 and then if they're not a top 10 in three years' time, switching again. They actually think if they, they think that they're in a good fund and they've established a relationship with that good fund, they're unlikely to switch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but we're up, we've asked them to provide some more, more evidence and research basis for that. So then in conjunction with the elevated my super, we've gotten rid of the tail, so we've gotten rid of a bunch of funds that are underperforming. So we're in a world where a bunch of good funds, a bunch of top-performing funds, and, and hopefully there'll be an element of churn in and out of the, the top 10 every every four years. Mm -hmm. But but um, be good in your post-draft report with a chance for your members to have a closer read of how we've addressed that in the report and the discussion today sure. uh, for you to raise any additional concerns. But I guess the only thing we ask is if people raise additional concerns, we don't just want polemic, we actually want an evidence base, so you'll need to mm -hmm. give us an evidence base because um, that's the only thing we really ask for, apart from people being truthful, um, to sort of convince us in... in you know, we do want to improve our, our draft recommendations and our findings where we can, but to do that, we, we need an evidence base to, to be course. able to mm. substantiate that. J just a final point in relation to the comments you made. Where, where I think we've, we've heard more than once the concern about fund behaviour being distorted in a way to try and get into that top ten, mm -hmm. I think that comes importantly to the criteria. And if the panel that's making the decision looks at a set of criteria and can see that this behaviour is being undertaken for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. that we would hope that that panel would be expert enough that they can see that. And it's not all about... So there's a misconception, I think, that what we've done in the report for the... Um, uh, where, where we've got charts showing the performance of the funds, that somehow that we can identify the 10 off those charts we've done, and we can't, and we haven't done that work. So we do say net investment returns are very important, but they're not the only thing, and they're long-term. So what you do in this quarter or this year or even the four years beforehand will be important, but what you've done in years before that will also count. So I think for, for a fund to think that they can somehow make a difference to their positioning in that top ten by doing something in the, you know, the quarter or the six months before 
the panel's going to make its announcement, I think, is misconceived. And, and I think the expert panel would see that behaviour for what it is. Mm. So I think we just need to go a little bit below what seems to be some of the misconceptions around how the panel would work. But if you had ideas about, we have about a page in the report about the criteria that we think mm -hmm. the panel should look at. And if you've got um, either concerns with what we've got there or additional criteria you think we should flesh out, that would also be very helpful. Yeah, because as Angela's pointed out, um, while net investment performance and a track record is important uh, for, for a best in show, it's what will the expert panel look to to think that investment performance historically, if it's been good, is likely to continue going forward. And we know that, particularly in a high growth or even a balanced growth investment strategy, there are some years where you actually don't want to be top of the pops um, if, if you're looking at maximising long-term long, long -term net returns um, through cycles. Um, so, so we've got things in there like the governance of the fund, we've got things about investment strategy, about understanding the membership, um, managing risks, product innovation, and we're not focusing just on the accumulation, we're looking at, at retirement and beyond retirement as well. So um, anyway, so that is an area where we're really hoping that funds can give us more feedback so we can be far more prescriptive and have a lot more flesh on the bones of, of those criteria going forward. Um, on the issue of the, um, the expert panel, and it's, it's, it's kind of funny that um, when you go back historically and look at the the, the, the informed narrative around um, politicised appointments. Uh, the one in Australia that's probably the most politicised is the FWC, and I, I don't have time this afternoon to go through so many quotes that we could do about how politicised those appointment processes are. Uh, it's similar to uh, appointments to high judicial courts in the US. But um, one idea that... So, so we want our expert panel to be accountable to the government of the day. Because at the end of the day, it's the government of the day that's compelled people to say when they otherwise may not have. It's also the government of the day and the, t and the taxpayers for that government of the day who are also um, subsidising um, the superannuation system. So, so to be accountable to the government of the day means it's got to be a government appointment and then to be accountable to the members, it's got to be an incredibly transparent and open process. People have then suggested, well, governments of the day will make those appointments and they'll be politicised appointments. So we... We did a little break <laughs> yesterday and did a little bit of kite flying. So we've come up with an idea of the selection committee for that expert panel being Caesar's wife, a beyond reproach. Um, so it would be a selection committee chaired by a statutory appointee who'd be seen um, to be able to make decisions without fear or favour of the government of the day and someone who would have knowledge of the financial system, financial markets, players in the industry the history of super and the like. Um, so we suggested that that could be chaired by someone like, you know, the Governor of the Reserve Bank with two other stat appointees. So it'd be good to get, and I'm, I'm assuming you've read the papers this morning and heard a little bit about the media coverage, but, and you may not have time to have discussed it amongst yourselves, but what do you think of that as an idea of depoliticising the appointments to the expert panel? Um, uh, look, uh, I think the government itself um, has struggled to find um, independent experts to fill the current vacancies um, for the expert panel um, in relation to the current process that is there for the selection of default funds on awards. Um, I think there's a very good reason why those appointments have been vacant for a while. It's because <coughs> it is difficult to find someone um, who is both an expert in superannuation matters um, and, in, and who is also um, independent slash non-conflicted. Um, I don't, I mean, in light of the government's, um, uh, you know, the government's uh, not being able to fill those roles, um, I don't know if a personnel change at the top will necessarily improve the situation in terms of who makes those selections. So I think the thing that the selection panel, say chaired by the Governor of the Reserve Bank, would need to take into account that the folk that they're, that they're thinking of appointing to the panel who would apply for the position um, would have a range of expertise, and again, we're seeking some feedback, but we would have thought yeah. some super expertise is fine, but at the end of the day, you want someone who's got investments expertise, financial mm -hmm. markets expertise, sure. consumer member expertise, mm -hmm. um, understanding risks um, supported by the government actuary. The expert panel will be able to do their own analysis and form their own evidence base when they're assessing the proposals to the expert panel. We've been paddling in this pool for, <laughs> for a couple of years now and, and Angela and I, between the two of us, can think of 20 people who we think would be 
pretty good for an expert panel that have no conflicts at the moment. Indeed, some of those people have been helping us in our journey. Yeah. Um, uh, so when we, when we have had some expert roundtables and when we have had some, some wise folk, including some people who are you know, sort of retired CIOs from super funds, um, some academics, um, some consultants that, that know this field. So we've, we've identified a bunch of people that mm -hmm. we think uh, could be potential candidates in the future. So we're not struggling. Uh, the main argument that people had against it was not that you couldn't find those people, mm -hmm. um, but that the appointment process would be politicised and thus the people that you would find and appoint, as was the case when we were at WC, mm -hmm. were considered to be um, not without conflict. Mm -hmm. okay. well, I, I was anyway, just sort of trying to explain our thinking mm -hmm. yeah, sure. around yeah. it to sort of help inform your chance to sort of discuss that with your membership and, and amongst... That's, yeah, it's really yeah. valuable that you brought that one forward. We'll need to consult further with our members on it. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, product dashboards. Um, product dashboards didn't end up being very dashing in the end. <laughs> and they, they, we ended up in a world of regulators arm wrestling with funds such that perfection got in the way of possibility. Um, so we've recommended that we want some confident pro-member uh, regulators actually consulting with technical experts, um, behavioural economists, consumer experts and <coughs> investment experts to come up with a one-page dashboard that is meaningful to members. Um, not so worried about it being meaningful for funds, but meaningful for members. Not from a legalistic disclosure perspective, but what behavioural economics would tell us members would then make a meaningful, sensible choice if provided with a simple, safe list. Um, of best in show plus dashboards associated with, with other elevated my super um, authorised products. We've also suggested that it should not just apply to my super. Indeed, when we looked at the, the um, performance problems and some of the other issues around related parties and all the rest of it and fees, um, the choice segment really needs to have product dashboards as well. So when you said you were supportive of product dashboards and hopefully we all get into a world of possibilities and, um, and not perfection, um, but possibilities that are meaningful to members as opposed to funds. Um, are you comfortable then with that being extended to, uh, your members comfortable with that being extended to, the, to their part of the paddling pool, uh, the, the choice segment? Yeah, absolutely. We think that data that's meaningful for consumers mm -hmm. is really important. Um, it's quite difficult to achieve um, because, you know, we are looking at quite complex products and I think we saw even trying to develop, you know, key fact sheets for home insurance was yeah, quite a complex process and what's come out of that is not necessarily always the most meaningful information. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a process, um, but definitely you know, one that we need to undertake and you know, certainly that needs you know, the right you know, behavioural economics and consumer testing mm -hmm. involved in the process to make sure that we're getting data that's actually meaningful to a person on the street okay. rather than just to fund members, uh, to funds, funds themselves. Yeah. And the process that we've set out with the regulator really taking the driver's seat on that and consulting with people that can do it from the perspective of what matters for members for them to make sound investment decisions? Or? Um, we haven't gone down a route of really testing with our members you know, exactly what that process mm -hmm. would look like, but I don't think we have a conceptual issue with that. Okay, great. Um, your opening remarks didn't touch on insurance, unless I've... No. 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 Okay. We've got a bunch of recommendations on insurance. Yep. Uh, the government those. had a bunch of things happening in the budget. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, they were something pretty similar to ours as well. Um, <laughs> is there any, any views that you've got on the, the, the draft recommendations and findings on insurance, or is that something that you're still progressing your thinking about? We've got some um, initial thinking on that. I, I guess our main thought on, on, on insurance about the the, the budget and your recommendations is that the fundamental principle there is the, the fundamental problem there is multiple accounts and, and we believe the best way to address that is by addressing multiple accounts not by tinkering with in more than tinkering with um, the insurance rules and because there will be unintended consequences to some of those proposals um, but I won't list them here we made a, a full response to the budget proposals. But in terms of the disclosure recommendations, um, you know, the erosion trade-off, yes, that's a good idea mm -hmm. if it can be done uh, in a 
in a clear, simple way. As you were saying before, sometimes perfection is the enemy of the good. Uh, so let's let's have something good. Um, the best interest, again, that that makes perfect sense. The um, condition um, of, of adopting the voluntary code of practice is a condition of keeping or getting authorization from my super. That that's no no problem with that at all. And a review, um, yes, but please let, let's let the current reforms in bed before we. We, we, uh, we'd undertake that so that we can really measure the effect of those. Yeah. So I think um, bolstering the insurance code is kind of like a must-have from our perspective, particularly when you want mergers to occur, mm. um, because at the moment what we hear is sometimes the impediment to mergers can be where you have very disparate insurance offerings. And we can understand there are some cohorts of um, high risk occupations um, where <coughs> having some tailoring of insurance for those groups may be needed. But for the rest of the sort of accumulation, members in the accumulation phase, we need to have more comparability of insurance offerings um, to make sure that um, transportability can happen over time if, as mergers occur mm. uh, and that doesn't continue to be an impediment. That said, we've got some uh, feedback as to from APRA and from others about um, how APRA's clarified uh, the equivalence test, which should make it easier for insurance not to get in the way of, um, of those mergers around insurance. So it'd be good if we could hear back from you about making sure that insurance is no longer an impediment uh, to mergers happening when it is clearly in the best interest of, of those members in an, in an underperforming or a subscale fund. The other thing that was interesting, though, that we've, we've only just learnt in the last couple of days is that um, a little bit more about the history of income protection insurance and that historically it was really only meant to be two years and where it's become expensive is where some of the, the policy offerings go beyond two years. Um, so that's something that, that was news to us. So again, if um, given your membership, you might be best placed to help us out with the prevalence of that because uh, insurance was another area where the data uh, was... Um, uh, I've run out of adjectives. Um, <laughs> One of the other areas, um, and I don't think you did cover it off in your um, uh, opening remarks, was around life cycle products. Um, we were actually kind of surprised to realise that life cycle products were 30% of default or my super products. Um, that seemed to be a pretty large number for us. And we know that there's a spectrum of life cycle products, like there's sort of some very vanilla basic ones and then there's some very smart ones that, that get dynamic efficiency happening. Um, I guess we did some funky stochastic modelling that we weren't planning to do, but we did, um, thanks to um, some dedicated staff members on the team. And it did show us that, um, it did suggest that the more simpler life cycle products for most members just take way too much growth off the table and it's a big price for an insurance policy they don't really need. Um, so we had a, I think we had a finding that, oh well, no, we had an information request that said, um, please explain why we should leave it in in the my super world, is is that something that that you've got a view on, or you will have a view on? <laughs> oh yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be looking at that. A number of our members are quite interested in life cycle products. I think that some of them are concerned that the uh, overall tenor of the PC's finding on this was a bit too negative, um, but we'll have to work that through with our members. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the thinking is that there would be, uh, let's say for example, we were looking at this just after the GFC, life cycle products would have actually looked quite good after the GFC. Um, so uh, there, there are a range of uh, things which we'll be looking at for in more detail on this Okay, one. well ho hopefully we have more evidence from your members than just it looked good at a particular point in time because that doesn't suggest that it's a good product. <laughs> um, but but we, we, we would need evidence um, and we've got our stochastic modelling on the table and mm. you've got, I think there's another lovely technical supplement mm. that details yeah. it. We, we had to review it ourselves. and um, So so your experts can have a look at that. But, but Michael, if, if your members are going to come back anti what we're saying on life cycle in my super, we need evidence mm. to show that, that we've either gotten the stochastic modelling wrong or, or there's another way of viewing it. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll we are very it. conscious that there are different products and indeed I think we're going to hear a little bit more about some of the smarter life cycle products a little bit later on this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, so it might be also more about the um, lumping them all together. Um, they appear 
um, whereas there's a diversity of um, performance within that, yeah. uh, that group. I think the key thing for us is what do you need to know about the member to do any life cycle product and do you have that knowledge mm. in a default right. segment or can you do it in the absence of not having had a communication with that member? I, so, and again, that's, I think that's the area that we're, we're, we're flowing through right. with. Um, I think the, the other point, I, I think, from, from the model that, if, I, if I'm reading it correctly, at this stage, you would, would sort of be your preferred model of let's not worry about the top ten and let's put all our faith in, a, in an elevated MySuper threshold. We've got some ideas about how to bolster that and we think it's important that it does get bolstered. I'd be interested if you had any views about what we've recommended there and if you've got it or if, and or if you're likely to have any suggestions around how it might be further um, enhanced if, if, if you were to uh, put a lot more emphasis on, on that really being more of a... having to do more of the work on its own. OK, we'll do that. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to say this afternoon that, that our questions didn't allow you to get to it? <laughs> we do appreciate it's been a lot to digest in a couple of weeks and you've got a broad, sure. a, a broad church of members to, to consult with. There are quite a lot of recommendations in the report that we're pretty happy with. I'll give you one example. It's the, um, your recommendations about encouraging uh, funds to merge. and we, we don't need to go through that now because yeah. we're, we're pretty happy yeah. with what you're recommending. Great. Okay, doke. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being able to, to make it here in person okay, um, to, to the Brisbane hearings. And um, we look forward to getting your post-draft report submission in, in a couple of weeks' time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat>
So broadly, we support the recommendations in the report. Uh, the first default, last default, as I call it, is, uh, is good policy. Uh, if the risks of poor selection and poor legacy defaults are mitigated, um, overall, the best in show consumer choice model uh, should work in, uh, if consumers are forced, we think, uh, pre preferably forced, or given a very strong nudge to make a choice before obtaining a TFN when they, first, they start their first job. The independent panel and selection criteria that are set are critical to the model's success. Um, we, we've heard your earlier comments about, about the expert panel and, and note those, but we actually think there are some very experienced superannuation experts in the industry that you can draw on, and we think that they are very independent, and that is the existing research houses and the existing, um, you know, the, the, the Chant West, Herons, Rice Warners, and, and super ratings in particular, but also some of the specialist superannuation experts within the big four accounting firms like PwC, Deloitte, KPMG and the like. So we think there are people there who are uh, expert, they understand the system, they understand how it works and they've got a point of view which they'd bring and those points of view I think would be different and that would add, add, add value. Um, obviously, having a superannuation lawyer uh, expert would be would be valuable. Um, also, potentially an actuary. You always got to have an actuary, apparently. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and perhaps a consumer advocate. So that was our thoughts on on the makeup of the panel. Uh, support recommendations. We support recommendations relating to the my super authorization as a means to reduce the legacy risk of, of the old default system for consumers um, following implementation of the new model. And we broadly support uh, insurance recommendations but do not necessarily support an independent review of insurance in super as necessary at this point. Those are the opening comments, thank you. Great, thanks very much um, Scott. And look, I, I should say, um on behalf of the Commission, we also did want to thank and Super for two things. One, that you've helped us along the way um, with the, the consultation that we did in Stage 1, Stage 2 and now today, but also for, for your board to allow you to appear at our hearings, both in Stage 2 and now. Um, oh. that's, that's quite a rare phenomenon <laughs> for us, and I think I referred to you last time as unicorn. Um, we now have a couple of unicorns, so, well, so, so the system's getting, system's getting better as we go. Um, so perhaps... Let's just work through maybe some of the, the little working agenda of, of your opening remarks. Um, with the twin problems that we identified in the system, just going to unintended multiple accounts first. Um, you might have heard me say before that we, the default once, unless a member chooses to do something else, which you support. The other option that's been put on the table by another inquiry participant or participants is the balance rollover model. Um, I don't know if you've had time to think about that all. It's the first time I've heard it this afternoon. I, my um, first blush, react, blush reaction is that I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I think um, members would be being dragged by their current em or their new employer into something new each time they change jobs. I think that would mm -hmm. actually lead to some disengagement and disenchantment in super. I don't think that would be necessarily helpful. Okay. Yeah, look, I think, I think um, it's probably fair to say it may be an improvement over today's system, um, but I guess um, one of the things that sort of seems apparent is that be, there's costs in moving members and money between funds on a regular basis, and mm. I guess it's sort of, I guess, a per what's the purpose of incurring those additional costs would be perhaps mm. the initial um, thoughts on, on that particular model, but I, I think it's fair to say it would be an improvement over what we have today. Yeah. So, so you're right, if the counterfactuals today it does look like an improvement, but if the counterfactuals another option on the table that maybe doesn't have the downsides of the balance rollover. So what would be helpful for us is um, in terms of some of the costs that might be attached to the balance rollover is if you've got any handle or could give us any guidance on um, the degree that you think that that sort of turnover might be happening within the system based <coughs> on your knowledge of, of your membership base. Um, but also just the admin cost side of it and whether or not it might have any implications for the investment strategy of a fund if, if that churn remains in the market as opposed to you getting a member as a new job entrant knowing that you've probably got them for a while unless you lose sight of, 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 of good purpose and endeavour and, and end up losing your my super authorisation. Um, the other thought we had was, and we know it's only a modicum of risk, but 
every time a balance rollover could occur, if, if you're in a situation of a market event, I think a GFC or, or, or even um, earlier um, major moves in equity markets that we've seen, um, whether a rollover at that time, if you're going from one strategy to a different strategy, could actually trigger a little sequencing risk event yeah. and, and crystallise a loss. And I know there's swings sure. and roundabouts. While one member might gain in that circumstance, another might be harmed. And at the end of the day, it's not a, a summation of those two to see if they cancel out. A member harm is a member harm. Um, so it'd be good to see if, if your smart in, in investment folk at Sunsuper could give us a little bit of a steer on that. Sure. The, the other thing that Angela touched on a bit before, which is really important, is um, any unintended consequences of the best in show list in terms of impacting the behaviour of funds. Now, we've tried to address that with the principles that we've established for what the expert panel might take into account for a best in show selection process. It would be great for us if, if you could have a look at that. It's, it's one page. It's actually quite a good one page in the report, I thought <laughs> the team drafted. Have a look at those principles. We want to make them a bit more prescriptive and add a bit more flesh to them. Um, you'll be mindful of what perverse incentives that could potentially create. We, we, we hope we've addressed most of them, but be good to get your feedback on if we have, how might that be detailed a little bit further to be quite prescriptive. Yep, sure. So we give the expert panel as much nudge help as possible um, sure. in that direction. Um, <coughs> the other thing that's been suggested in the industry that, that we kind of struggled in, and I went through the metrics before, and I won't, so I won't go through them again now, about the flows, is a suggestion that the 10 best in show might be a cosy oligopoly. That kind of just didn't intuitively make sense to us because of the flows and what you'd have to assume with switching rates. But also a cosy oligopoly isn't 10 subject to competition every four years. Yeah, sure. So, again, if we could get your feedback in, in your post-draft report submission on how it would look with those flows over time. We did some transition modelling in our report um, that, that the, uh, the good regulator, APRA, had a look at, and they seemed to think it was all pretty sensible and reasonable. And the reason that we got them to have a look at it is because at the end of the day, by elevating the MySuper authorisation and then creating a best-in show for the true underperformers, it is going to have an impact on their cash flows, but we want it to have an impact on their cash you flows. Do. So they start to go more net negative than they are at the moment, and thus nudging those trusty boards um, to merge when they should be merging. Mm. Um, so be good for you to have a look at that in terms of what matters for us is what it means for members, and what it means for members is that that excess, the exits of those funds, is digestible by the system. Um, APRA has gotten back to us that they think it is. Our transitional modelling suggests it is, but it'd be good to have some folk kick the tyres on that. Yeah, sure. Our initial view on that is that it, it probably is um, when you look at it in isolation, but when you look at what's already happening in the context of the system, you've just mm. got to be careful that things don't compound. So yeah. the budget changes in themselves we think will have a big impact on funds and a big ac impact on activity and consolidation in the industry already. Yeah. Um, you add to that whatever, whatever might come out of the Royal Commission as well in terms of recommendations that, that, that could add to that context. And so mm -hmm. I think it's looking at the, all of the change mm -hmm. that's being imposed in the system in context and deciding you know, mm -hmm. is, if that's manageable. Okay. Um, there, there will be, uh, we think, a limit to how much consolidation activity can occur in the market in the system in a particular year. And, and we acknowledge that, and I guess what we would like to hear back is, if you have a look at what we're, what the transition modelling looks like, um, give us a sense of whether you think that's digestible. The regulator's saying it is, but it'd be good to hear sure. it from, from we'll some of the larger funds as well. Uh, and I guess pertinent to your point is, the regulator might be saying, yes, these people can come through and, it'll, and it's all digestible. What you're saying is, there's constraints on your side as well. <laughs> so there's got to be parties willing to negotiate in a time frame that works and all those things. So it's um, you, you might have... Yeah, well, transitions... Yeah, from the other side of the table, you might have a, you might have extra views that you can put to us. Sure. On transitions issues, do take so. time and yeah, cost. And that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, I guess we're also getting a little bit of mixed evidence about what are the impediments to mergers remaining. And, and I guess the area that we're interested in now is not the impediments for the trustee board that does need to merge making that decision, because um, we think we know what they are, but, but for a larger top performing fund, or, or a top performing fund, um, from taking the membership from those underperforming funds that are exiting, are there any impediments um, there at the moment around the equivalence test, or making sure that the, the, 
the denominator of the, the fund um, that's taking those members can actually take those members at a, that's not a cost imposed upon their own membership base. Sure, that's, that's critically important. You'll, we can't allow existing members to be paying for yep. mergers of, uh, of new members. Um, we don't think the impediments are that great, um, and, uh, but we will come back in some more detail, but Jason might have some initial comments. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think it, it, there's largely the mechanisms um, within the existing system to, to enable, facilitate, execute mergers once a, once a decision has um, been made, in principle mm -hmm. been made. Um, I think it then fundamentally comes down to things like um, legacy product and to what extent that it's continued, um, capacity of the receiving organisation, capacity of the outgoing organisation to be able to execute on these mergers successfully mm -hmm. um, because of course the last thing anyone in our system wants is for a merger to be executed poorly um, which, would, which would be um, a very bad thing for trust in the system. Yeah. Um, the other area that we touched on was the, the elevated my super. Um, uh, one aspect of where we've taken it further, so scale test at the moment, outcomes test coming through in, in proposed legislation, and we've added some more teeth to the outcomes test. One of our suggestions there, and it's really just an insurance policy to make sure the tail doesn't regrow over time, mm -hmm. is to say that going forward, if a fund persistently over a five-year period can't meet its own portfolio benchmark and underperforms it by 25 basis points or something like that, so you can't even sort of meet the market performance um, for the index for, for that um, each of those asset classes, that would be a basis for APRA saying, please hand back your my super authorisation. So we're just trying, and I don't want to put you on the spot today if you haven't had time to think about it, but we're just trying to make sure that, that that's reasonable. Um, and, and when we kind of think about it, we kind of think, well, if there's a market event, then the indexes for the different asset, asset buckets would, would move as well. It would have to be something about the investment calibre and the investment performance of that fund that's meant that it's persistently underperformed over those five years. Mm. We we haven't uh, we haven't discussed that in great detail, but but just uh, listening to those comments, I think uh, we we saw it in the report and the analysis in the report was very good. But um, the more you analyse the performance of a fund down to an asset class or sub asset class level and look for benchmarks of comparison, you're actually starting to remove recognition of the investor skill in, in the investment portfolio. So asset allocation adds a lot, can add a lot of value in, in terms mm -hmm. of outperformance. Um, and if you're sort of removing asset allocation mm -hmm. as, a, as a source of um, alpha, I think that's, that's perhaps a mistake. I, so I, we wouldn't re re remove it, Scott, as a... As a as as a source of alpha, indeed, that would be reflected in the absolute returns sure. within the market. But, but it is looking for the lack then of the investor skill. So, <coughs> by providing a benchmark of what's the value add above and beyond asset allocation um, that the fund is bringing. So, if you can't meet the market with the same asset allocation as the market of the collection of the market indices, um, should you still be practicing? Sure. Well, I think we'll come back on that. Yeah, but my, my, um, I, I like to keep things simple. I'm a CEO, not a CIO. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, whatever you put on the tin in mm -hmm. terms of the risk profile of your product yep. is what you should be compared against. So, a reference portfolio that applies to the growth profile or the risk profile on the on the uh, that you put in your PDS, and being compared against that, I think is is the right way to go because if you start breaking things down, um, investors have an incredibly good way of demonstrating they're outperforming. Yeah, they have. <laughs> yeah, you can break things down and demonstrate you're outperforming on a certain basis. So, I think just keeping it when it comes to the best in show. I mean, I understand the analysis you've done for the for the report, mm. but when it comes to the best in show, what are you putting on? What do you say you're going to do, and how are you performing against that? in terms of a risk. Yeah, and, and really what we're thinking is, is the portfolio benchmark the right way to nip in the bud someone heading back into the tail of woe 
and taking the MySQL authorization off them before we end up with a 12-year period of entrenched underperformance. So that's right. where we're focusing it. And you're right, it's not, a, it's not, um, it's, it's not the, at the rocket science end of performance attribution analysis that we know that a lot of the, the funds are doing. <coughs> it's, it's a very simple form by just taking SAA off the table and, you know, could you actually meet the market? Um, sure. you, you did mention more than a modicum of hesitation about a, a future insurance review. Um, and, and we kind of understand that you guys feel like you're reviewed to death, um, whether it's a parliamentary committee, a productivity commission, mm -hmm. or a very royal commission. Um, I guess what was behind our thinking was uh, we were pretty unimpressed with the insurance code of conduct. Um, that for us was kind of a little too little too late, to put it pretty bluntly. And, right. and there was a lot of good endeavour and good effort by the industry to try to get there. But when we saw where it started and where it finished, we thought, if we leave this with industry in three years' time, we're going to be having the same – government will be having the same conversation. Thus, we thought it was healthy to have the discipline of a review, and not just a review in terms of how the industry's done it, improving things in insurance, but also has the regulator done what we've asked them to do mm. in working with the industry to make sure that insurance is value for money for members going forward. So that's kind of our motivation. Um, and I can understand reluctance for any, any future reviews, but given that's the motivation. So perhaps a couple of comments. Yep. Um, so your draft recommendations really call out two areas of review. Um, one is around the effectiveness of the code, mm -hmm. and that recommendation we're supportive of. Um, I think it might be recommendation 18 or 19, which is a further review which talks to um, the value of su uh, insurance in super, um, opt-in versus opt-out model. Um, our view is that um, with the code of conduct changes, the federal budget changes likely to come over the top, um, a lot of the um, core parts of the weakness of insurance in mm -hmm. super will be addressed. Yep. And um, we have concerns that um, the opt-in model potentially for all is one that continues to float out there and we believe opt-out insurance in super is fundamentally a social good for the country. And so um, anything that really um, looks to put that on very shaky ground with another review is something we couldn't reasonably support. Yeah. And I can understand that from the industry's perspective, but it's kind of history interesting when you go back and look at the history. Nobody's ever asked and answered that question. Nobody's ever really asked and answered, is dealing with underinsurance in the Australian workforce best addressed by putting insurance in super. That said, we did say in our report that we think on the whole it does deal with under insurance in a very cost effective way as long as they're getting value for money. So we agree that if you fix up the value for money piece and see where you get to in three or four years time, that's a health check tick. So yep. that part of the scope of the review you're fine with in terms of have you guys done what we hoped you would do? Yes, we're supportive of that. But nobody's ever asked and answered or done the analysis around, is doing it through super the best way? And what is the degree of underinsurance in Australia? And is this the best way of doing it? it just, it's kind of just evolved historically. Sure. And there have, there have been a number of reports by a number of consultants over the years that have looked at that issue. Um, yep, and we've looked at those reports yeah, and, and sure nobody's spoke. really fulsomely <laughs> asked and answered that question. So, but um, I, I guess um, in our observation, um, from those reports, experience mm -hmm. of our membership, um, there's very few commentators which are suggesting that there's an over-insurance problem. Um, it is a typically an under-insurance problem and the system going at least part of the way to address that in a low-cost, mm -hmm. effective, comprehensive way is a very good thing and we should protect it. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and we're probably not disagreeing with that, mm -hmm. um, but... but um, some have suggested that uh, we should have moved to a world of opt-in for everybody, um, and that's not what our terms of reference took us to. Ours was, that's the architecture, let's make it work as best as possible. So I can take it from your comments then, you're okay with the health check part of it? Absolutely. But not the board of it. And that's, that's fine, we can totally yeah. understand that. Alrighty. Uh, do you have some views about IP? Because that's been one of the other issues. I mean, we, we call it out in the report as a bit of the culprit and it's mainly the multiple accounts issue that comes up there, but also a diversity of offerings within funds that we know about with IP 
sometimes not being offered, sometimes for two year period and sometimes for you know up to the age of retirement. Do you have views about the appropriate role of IP in super and whether or not that part of it should be opt in or opt out? Yeah, so, um, so our view is that um, IP does have a role. Um, we do think it should be opt in, um, even though it might be um, not the majority of cases, in fact, it's probably a, a small minority of cases where the risk of duplicate policies or offsets in, in IP uh, can mean that when it comes to claim time, members might get a shock that they cannot claim. And, and we think that there's an, a risk there around erosion of trust. And so that's why we believe an opt-in approach um, is appropriate um, and we wouldn't pursue an opt-out approach. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the current policy for SunSuper for yeah, your devolved correct. products? Yeah. So it's we offer IP, yep. and a variety of benefit periods and waiting periods, okay. but opt-in. Okay. Yes. And would you be able to share with us when it's done on an opt-in basis across your membership cohort, how many people took it up, age groups, sure. and then what the premiums were compared to the default <coughs> IP products that are on an opt-out basis in some of the, the larger funds that would kind of be comparable to you guys? Yeah, sure. That, that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Terrific. I love setting homework. <laughs> You've given us <laughs> <laughs> I know, Scott's OK. We're not doing any more inquiries. <laughs> not taking <laughs> we, any holidays, eh? <laughs> actually, indeed, uh, Commissioner McRae and I, when, when we <laughs> talked about that recommendation at the Commission meeting about doing a, another one on insurance down the track, we said that we're conflicted, we can't do it. <laughs> 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 um, I think we've covered all the bases. I think so. Is there anything else that we haven't allowed you to say that you hoped our questions might get you to this afternoon? Um, I think it, it might be good to perhaps make a couple of comments on life cycle. Mm. Ah, thank you. Good one. Um, so, um, so we um, we have read the obviously the report, um, and um, we are supportive of um, life cycle arrangements as a principle. Um, we do acknowledge that um, that uh, not all life cycles are created equal, and there are some um, life cycle products there which could be better designed. Um, and why we think life cycle is so important is it, 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 there is a fundamental risk that applies when members approach retirement being sequencing risks, which is quite different from investment timing risk, sequencing risk, which is um, if members do see that large fall, get a GFC type of event, their retirement income can be irreversibly damaged um, and they just don't have either the time frame or the ability to stop payments to recover. And so we think sequencing risk is very real. Um, it can have a significant impact, and it'll be not too often it happens, but when it does happen to members, it'll have a, a big impact throughout their retirement, which is something to we should reasonably look to reduce mm -hmm. that risk. Mm -hmm. um, our view is that, um, that as people approach retirement, um, typically their risk tolerances may reduce. Um, they don't have as much runway, they don't have much human capital, that tends to decrease, so they need their financial capital to hold up. Um, and um, frankly, members may have no idea that a balanced option could drop substantially the year or two before they approach retirement. So we think there's a place for life cycle funds. We do think it's really important that they're well designed. Um, so including features like don't de-risk too early because you leave too much money on the table. Mm -hmm. So our approach is from 55. Um, we think products which have big step downs in growth assets um, is, a, um, is something that really shouldn't occur. It should be incremental over time to take out, minimise the timing risk. Um, we think some can lack transparency. So, um, so do members really understand yep. what it is? Um, and comparability, some lack comparability. And so we think um, if you can design life cycle products which address those issues, do risking too early, step changes, lack of transparency, comparability, then they are fundamentally a good thing. Um, so that would be our feedback um, on life cycles. And we believe our approach, of course, does just that. Which in default? Or in, in the choice world? No, in, the default, the, in, in default. default. Because these are, these are members who are not engaged. Yep. They will not necessarily understand the volatility of markets, the volatility of um, investment <laughs> returns within super funds, and to uh, naturally taper to some extent towards a retirement age um, takes a little risk off the table, but it's worth it for that event. Okay. 
which means their retirement income will be irreversibly damaged forever, um, which a balanced option okay. doesn't inherently do. So a couple of things then. So one thing it would be good to get feedback on the stochastic modelling that we did because we did it at, at um, de-risking at different age profiles. Um, you know, ridiculously some start at 30, but uh, we, we did it across a number of age profiles, I'm, I'm assuming including 55, which is sort of like a natural one in mind. But um, the, the thing that that had struck us, and indeed this followed some earlier discussions um, in our previous work, is that the, the sequencing risk at the time of retirement depends on what's drawn down from the account. And based on what we did about post-retirement super and indeed housing decisions of older Australians, um, the, the cohort that tended to have the biggest sequencing risk were those that had the lower balances that were doing a big lump sum drawdown. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know, you would know the balances of your members projected for retirement, so you've got a bit of an idea of their proclivity to do that. But if you've got members that have got larger balances, so they're not going to do a lump sum drawdown, or, or you, you don't know actually what sort of drawdown behaviour you're going to see from a member. You can sort of imagine for some cohorts with you know a balance of under $80,000, we know that they're more likely than not to do a large lump sum drawdown based on the data that we've looked at previously. Yep. But how do you kind of know across the whole cohort that you're dealing with in a default segment product, in a default my super product, that um, what that drawdown risk is if you don't know the, the risk appetite and the needs of the member to do that sort of drawdown? So we do know some things. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously know past pattern of behaviour from members, be it rolling over to account-based pensions or, or cash withdrawals at retirement. Yep. But we also do know they're going to at least take the minimum and we know some members take more, and um, and it's that um, it's it's that regular drawdown in addition to the lump sum of retirements, which um, basically produces the sequencing okay. risk. Um, so we we have and we can model um, on minimum drawdowns, other type of drawdowns, lumps up up front, and minimum drawdowns, and we can see where the modelling kicks into irreversibly. Okay. Damage those retirement so would it be helpful for us in the post-draft report submission, and, uh, and this won't require further homework because you've already done the analysis for the business case that obviously went to your trustee board where you designed sure. this product, is what you've shown to be the net benefit based on the way that you've designed the product? Because then it becomes an issue of is it an appropriate product or not for your cohort? Yes. And you've made that business case. Mm. Whereas when we looked at a whole bunch of the well, the team looked mm -hmm. at a whole bunch of the policies that were out there at the moment and did stochastic analysis, it, they didn't look like they were value net benefits to for most but only a small number of members. So that would be good for us to get a yeah. hand on. And we, we definitely agree with the comparability point, um, mm -hmm. the, the difficulty of comparing some funds. The way that we've done is we've got building blocks. So we've got a balance fund and we've got our retirement fund and cash. Yep. Um, and basically we have the life cycle at the administration level by member. So each individual member moves each month a little bit yep. between those portfolios. And those portfolios are the flagship portfolios that are comparable with all other funds. Okay, and how they move individually is a function of uh, their balance and their age and what you're anticipating will be their drawdown in retirement during that transition period based on historic what you've seen historically across your membership? It's based upon um, very much age and the targeted landing position at age 65, yeah. Okay, alrighty, that'd be helpful. So thanks well, for reminding us to ask you about life cycle. <laughs> life cycle. <laughs> So the, the one very last thing, and we, and we didn't mention it with some of the others, where perhaps we should, is just your views around mandatory sippers and the, mm. the offering and whether or not you think it, that that's a good thing and if you are offering one, ultimately would you see it as a positive or a negative in making it a mandatory take-up as well as a mandatory offering? That's your question. So I, I'm quite happy for you not to take the question now if you want to no, consider it. But um, so, so we do have some views. Um, so um, broadly we're, we are supportive of... Um, um, availability, importantly availability of longevity products. Mm -hmm. um, for um, our particular membership, um, which typically have lower balances, um, they, uh, for, for most of our members, they may not serve a need and there'll be some members with very high balances where it may be necessary either, but there is certainly a, a significant group in the middle where they um, can and, and potentially should serve mm -hmm. a purpose. We certainly wouldn't be supportive of a mandatory take up um, we don't believe that's consummate with um, the principles of our, of our system. Um, the, um, in our experience, um, the temptation for the industry is to go to um, product for a solution. 
we actually believe advice and service in the lead up to and in retirement is much more important mm. and we do agree with the um, PC's view around the availability of products is generally there and can meet the needs of not most members. It's really about advice and service. Um, so that, that would be um, yeah. our initial views. We're supportive of the development of, of, of SIPAs and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and developing a, a market, um, but compulsion certainly not. Um, and it, we think it will serve a need for some members, even though um, they, can be, um, they can be a little bit pricey, particularly at the moment where interest rates are at. Yeah, it would be great if you could capture that in your post-draft report submission as well. And in particular, and I guess we flagged it in this report, and indeed we flagged it back when we did um, post-retirement super, when SIPA was just sort of starting off post-Murray as, as a concept, that um, we're concerned about a my retirement um, being a soft default when we know in a world of nudges um, a lot of folk might end up there in the absence of advice saying that that's not appropriate for you. Um, so we're, we're sort of, we're doing a little bit of a warning Will Robinson around this. So to, yeah. to some extent, if those concerns are shared, we'd, we'd love to hear about those and, and the evidence that's informed your thinking about it based on your membership and what's appropriate and what's not. Yeah, and, and we are working on a, on a SIPA solution, um, but the market is very thin right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 uh, the market's not ready for, for SIPAs just yet, so there needs to be more development of product. Thank you. I think we really will let you I go now. I think we promised to nearly let you go a few times, so, but we will. That's all right. I'm um, happy to take any yeah. last No, no, thank no, you very much. You. That all was right. terrific. Well, thank you. Thank Great. You. Thanks very much. Our next uh, inquiry participants from Q Super will just let you get settled there and Thank you. have the great luxury of a glass of Brisbane water. <laughs> warmer than wa warmer than water elsewhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> come to come to warm Melbourne. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon um, and, and also for, for QSuper's help along the way. You've been one of the, um, what we refer to as technical experts that we've reached out to at, at, on occasion and, and in particular when we were doing a lot of the heavy lifting back in stage one, which then did allow us to do, come up with the evidence base that we've got now for stage two. But um, for the purposes of the transcript, if you could each just say your name and organisation and then if you'd like to make some brief opening remarks. Sure. Brad Holzberger, I'm the Chief Investment Officer of QSuper. And Glenn Hipwood, Executive General Manager of Strategy at QSuper. Well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to share our experience um, and insight, particularly around life cycle investing. I think it's been the topic of the last couple of days, so hopefully we can add to that debate for you. Uh, QSuper wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly supports the PC's intent to lift the standard of default products. And in fact, we contend the, the criteria for assessing default fund <coughs> status when you combine it with the requirements of the fund's default investment option, will fundamentally shift members' retirement outcomes. We therefore support the holistic approach in proposing a diverse range of measures as part of the default selection process. We do note, though, as others do, that any best-in-show criteria presents a comparability challenge. The ultimate goal is to protect members and elevate members' best interest and so therefore, while comparability is important, it should not be simplified and come at the cost of member outcomes. We would like to call out the interplay between providing a suite of products for members and ensuring they get the best out of the ones that are provided. Embedding advice in products is important and certainly better than one size fits all solutions. But as the Commission notes, so is providing access to assistance and advice services. QSuper would contend that early advice is just as critical as advice closer to retirement, in particular close to 55 that is contended by some. Our experience indicates that across our various channels, and QSuper has services from telephone-based services, digital advice as well as face-to-face -face provided in-house, that the use varies with age. 
but the outcomes are no less critical depending on when you get that advice. So for example, the majority of, our, the majority of those seeking face-to-face -face advice, more than 75%, are over 55. But there's just as many 25 to 29 year olds using our digital advice service as there are to age 60 to 64 year old brackets. Likewise, our contact centre takes more than 350,000 calls a year, but from about 200,000 unique clients. So the majority of our membership, or 40 odd percent, close to 40% of our members use our services each year. And now to the topic of the last two days regarding life cycle products. QSuper contends that modern life cycle products using more than one cohort factor do not forego returns across a member's working life. We put to the Commission that opportunity cost exists in all default investment options when using the hindsight argument. For example, why is the default benchmark for a balanced fund 70-30 rather than 100 and zero? With hindsight, the more aggressive portfolio would have derived the best asset-based return over a number of time periods in the last decade. All would agree that the product needs vary across ages and circumstances, and so the challenge of default products is how best to meet the extremes and everything in between. The question is therefore, how can we best meet our fiduciary duty in that default environment if we are not utilising what we know about the member? Age, gender, account balance, to either customise our investment strategies to devise a retirement income. We've been working towards the next generation of our product for a number of years. We do have experience over the last five since our lifetime product uh, went to market in 2013. So given our experience, we're more than happy to take um, questions from the Commission, and we do note some of the homework um, that you've provided today <laughs> from a number of the other funds. Sure. So if they're doing it, you don't need to, is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> oh, no, we're more than happy to answer those no, no, questions. No, 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 no We've already done just, it. <laughs> sorry, just, just a moment of jest, a moment of jest. Um, maybe we might start with life cycle then, um, sure. and, and this is a, a topic that we had discussed with you a while back as well as we were sure. sort of shimming our way up the exponential part of the learning curve, and, and sure. as I said a little bit earlier this afternoon, life cycle wasn't an area that we really expected to get into in this inquiry, and it was only when we realised that sure. it was 30% of my super products that we thought we'd yes. better have a closer look at it to make sure it is an appropriate product. And we do appreciate there's a huge spectrum, but yes. across that spectrum there might be some good smart life cycle products, but in my super there's a lot sure. of life cycle products that aren't. <laughs> sure. And, and how do we deal with that in a world of default? Sure. So I guess there's a couple of issues. So firstly, it'd be good for us to understand what data or knowledge do you need of your cohort, your membership, to be able to do the smarter life cycle as you've done it over time? And in that context, I note that QSuper is a rare beast in terms of you do have access to much better data on your membership than other typical sure. super funds would have. No, um, <clears throat> all that you said is true. Um, the life cycle product, and we actually will ascribe to the life cycle word, but we don't see our life cycle product anything like the product, for example, that's tested in your report. So while those conclusions might, might be sound, they're just not relevant to what we do. Mm -hmm. um, as Glenn was saying, we would expect our life cycle style of management to actually improve the risk adjusted returns, not sacrifice them. Yeah. In terms of the data, um, you would be aware of the MySuper prescribed factors and they give a, a guide to the first level of data that's required. Uh, the current generation of life cycle management at QSuper uh, will take into account age, account balance and gender. All super funds have that data, it's about getting access to it. But in addition to those simple um, prerequisites of data, we also look at a lot. We've done a deep analysis of 20,000 financial planning records to show what members thought, what financial planners thought in different circumstances almost the start of an AI type approach. We've looked at our members' activity, both choice members and also surveying members and getting their behavioural responses, in addition to the wealth of uh, literature in the behavioural finance and economics um, world. We've looked at what academics and others are saying. Um, we combine all of that to try and get um, a sense of what the risk tolerances and expectations of members can be that will be imperfect. And one thing that I would stress, and I hope I get the chance to say it more than once, we see this as a continuous improvement path. 
We do not think that the life cycle fund or QSIPA lifetime that we first initiated in 2013 was good. We think the one that's about to be done and the, our trustees have commissioned us to go to the next phase will be better. And the one that our successors bring forward in another 10 years time will be better again. It will be better because our technology and our understanding will be better. And what we hope is that the industry, and we hope spurred by your <laughs> recommendations, engages in this life cycle debate and th their learning together with our learning and the work that academics and others are doing will just lead the industry forward. You know, we're, we're well short of anything optimal here. And the only thing we can say is we're getting better with each iteration. We know where we want to go. I, can, I could define success, but to get there. So we use a lot of data, lots and lots of it. And it's amazingly available if you philosophically apply the view we need to know about these things. Mm -hmm. So the way that you've approached it then going be to understand the risk tolerance of the member and the risk tolerance of the member sure. behind that is informed by what they might want to do with that money in retirement as well, like how yes. much of they might want to draw down. So you can understand when we see people just doing it on age, gender and balance, sure. absent what might be the risk preference of the member and their circumstances, sure. that takes us to a world of choice and financial advice, sure. not a world of default. But it sounds like in your word of default, you've been able to replicate that through sure. the, the analysis that you've done, the surveys that you've done, um, drawing on the 20,000. Yes. Who else in the industry is doing that, Brad, <laughs> across the life cycle providers? I can't. I can't authoritatively say who's doing it. Not enough, Karen, is the answer. <laughs> yeah. um, as I said before, we would love to see more in-depth work done so we can learn from it. Okay. We're happy to contribute, but it is very unlikely that a group of people, even guided by trustees and investment committees and academics who are very skilled, we're not going to get the right answer. We will be much, much better able to get it if this philosophy of um, member centricity, if this philosophy of trying to understand and then manage risks, if we can bring all, and all the different spheres of knowledge. Mm. I'm an investment specialist. I am not the only person who works on QSuper Lifetime. We bring a whole range of expertise to bear. If I could, I'll, I'll mention um, the comment you made about choice. We actually see, we are a little at odds there. We actually see these types of products as far more applicable to the default. In choice, our members take, the own take their own initiative. They do what they think is best. Financial planners, good financial planners working with the wealth of information that a member can provide about their very own circumstances is probably great. Not every Australian has that. And as Glenn was saying, they tend to do it later in life once everything's done. They are almost trying to recover circumstances. We would much prefer that they start getting advice early to create the right circumstance to the extent that we can um, perhaps poorly represent that but at least attempt to represent it mm. through a default we think is absolutely applicable. If members choose to do their own I hope, I would challenge members who do their own to do it as well as we do it. Yeah. They should be able to do it better, but what we lack in precise member information, we make up a little bit with investment expertise, asset liability mm -hmm. modelling, all of that wealth of experience we can bring about the markets they operate in, academic literature about their risk tolerance. We sort of know where they're going to end up. <laughs> Yeah. whereas they may have a, a great sense of where they are. No. And I think the, the challenge is about the comparability of the alternative as well in terms of the single mm. asset class or the, the single multi-sector class as a default. Yeah. So while we're talking about lifetime and where the, the evolution of lifetime will go, we, we actually start at the, at the base. Yeah. Sure. What, what is the primary starting point and is, is it a balance sure. as the most appropriate single sector? And, and look, the only reason why we were saying why put it in default and why we ended up thinking, well, shouldn't it belong in a world of choice? It was really because understanding the risk tolerance and the preferences of the member at retirement to know what insurance policy they might need through life cycle, uh, to us seemed to only happen in a world where people were practically getting financial advice in the choice segment. So it wasn't the choice segment in and of itself, it was answering mm. that question about 
the, what the member needed at the point of retirement. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you show us a world of where you're able to replicate that in a different way without it being about individual, individual members getting financial advice, which means there is a possibility of it working in the default segment. We're then faced with a situation where you might be a unicorn in the way that you do it. Sure. And how do we deal with the inappropriate products that members are mm -hmm. unwittingly and unknowingly defaulting into today that could be grossly inappropriate looking at our stochastic modelling? Um, it depends on how you position the criteria for your selection. You have already gone out on a limb, I think, as a commission and said that you feel there should be um, an expert panel that selects the best in class. I think what you've just described is the start of the criteria. We would be very happy to work in an industry where the better funds, be they 10 or be they more, fewer, more, whatever, meeting all the various things to get in this. They then you know, adopted the highest standard of investment strategy setting and not um, reverse that onus to say, well, we've got to give everybody a choice, so we just want to get rid of the bad ones. I mean, set the standard the other way, aim for the best. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you yourselves have spoken about, your report's made it quite clear that you expect a dynamic approach to this, that there will be rotation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's use that to, I, I think you've got a challenge. The, the, the legislators have already legislated my super criteria. They've thrown so our simple response to that was recognise the problem and we have the ability to adapt strategy to those different account balances. Okay. So homework then. Um, <laughs> our principles at the moment for Best in Show do look at product innovation and investment strategy. Yes. So give us your suggested guidance on how that the expert panel could look at these sorts of elements of as well. Um, that still leaves us with the problem, that's best in show, how do we deal with the existing um, legacy of the not so clever life cycle products that members are currently defaulted into? Um, Given that the stochastic modelling that the team did do, do does apply to a bunch of those, Brad. No, no, it, and it does. And um, now I, I, th I think there's work that can be done to improve that modelling and we've, we've Okay. talked we, about we, this we both, and, yeah. and we're happy to, to talk about that I think and, and indeed one of your later um, um, people who will testify later I know is one of the people around the world who is best um, regarded in this area and published extensively on this so we're, we're not without guidance as to how mm. to do that we've got our own our own way just recently in fact I finished a, a paper our board called for a review of our work our Q Super lifetime outcomes over the five years or so that it's been going and said and took as the counterfactual where we were, which was mm. essentially a balanced fund, and asked that very question. Mm. You know, how how good or bad has this been compared to the balanced option? Now a short period, one fund. But I can tell you the results of that, and we're happy to share the very detail of the results with you, is that eighty percent of the members were better off even in a period where risk was heavily rewarded. Mm -hmm. So 80% of the members mm -hmm. were better off. 50 uh, everyone in our fund, under the, uh, in our default fund, under the age of 50 has 100% in growth asset. These issues that you're bringing up. So how do you stop the underperformers? I would say show them what you regard and what the expert panel would eventually regard as best practice. That's how we do it. <laughs> we, we don't make it up. We sort of try and find okay. no, best no. practice and try and get there. Demonstration effect. Exactly. Yeah. And and it's because otherwise we're in a world of ASIC using product intervention powers against yeah. inappropriate products. Yeah. Like one of the things that your expert panel, if if impaneled, <laughs> if, if your uh, recommendations <laughs> are accepted, I suppose. But one of the things that they will do, they will have an enormous power to influence standards. They, they will make a decision about 10, but they will give a signal that will rocket around the place. And every CIO in the country, every CEO in the country will try and emulate that. And you've already alluded to it. You're not just going to go and pick the ones that did a good job last year. Mm -hmm. Presumably that criteria, what your own criteria, draft criteria says, show us leadership. And if you create leadership, sound research, a willingness to experiment. This is not science, it's art. Um, I'd like to see the rest of the world following us. The rest of the world sort of is following us. Australia leads. 
Our academics are the leaders in the research on this. Our legislators are the leaders in, in you know, through the My Super legislation and prescribed factors. The industry, fledgling, and, and we may be uh, uh, the example, but in terms of actually saying, this is more than research, this is more than theory, you can actually do this. And we can list more effectively the shortcomings of what we're doing than the advantages. So, so it's not hard. It's just a matter of changing that mindset and that philosophy. Your top 10 panel made it clear that that's the standard to aspire to. They'll go past, the, the industry will go past us and we will be but one of many, hopefully, chasing perfection. Mm -hmm. Never getting there, but chasing it. We'd love to do that. Well, that's what injecting competition for a market <laughs> should be. I think that's what you're trying should, to do. Should spur innovation, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, Getting rid of the bad ones, I think you've got yeah. it. <laughs> like, yeah. if, if it works as it's designed to work. Yeah. We touched on earlier um, getting rid of unintended multiple accounts, not just mopping up the legacy, but stopping them from um, uh, arising. We came up with the default once, unless a member going forward chooses to go to another fund mm -hmm. or product. Um, the other option on the table, and you probably heard me before, was yep. suggested that the balance roll over. It'd be good to get your thoughts on what might be the costs um, and unintended impacts of, of that in a world of, um, uh, of of trying to get member engagement or, or member interest, as we're told is probably a better word, um, and, and keeping the costs as low as possible. Yeah, we, we certainly acknowledge the point you said before about exit costs, even employment patterns, future employment patterns. If you're looking to invest through a life cycle investment, what does that do when members are continually changing products and services mm -hmm. across different um, investment suites? So we'll certainly take that um, away and, and give it more consideration about the multiple options that are out there and the implications for members and funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it would be helpful in doing that to give us a bit of the evidence base from your perspective about what the cost might be to a member um, sure. of, of that shifting sure. pattern behaviour. And, and for us, the counterfactual is default once unless they choose to go somewhere else as opposed to the benchmark being today where we do have a lot of members sure. already kind of yeah. doing that with auto Some of the data we probably don't have is the inertia of members once they've made a choice at a system level. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. We talked before about... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do individuals, if they're in the top ten, what is the inertia for them to stay and not make a choice ever again? Mm. Um, so it's probably a, a challenge as opposed to the inverse mm. that they will make a choice. Yeah, um, we just hope that we've we've mitigated the risks of them not making an ongoing choice based on they're either in a top performer or they're in a good performer if we've lopped off the tail. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as, as a general observation, never yeah. underestimate the ability of the superannuation industry to find solutions to these challenges. It's about testing. Uh, these things that you've brought up, many of them, are real and legitimate challenges. The industry should rise to it, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of skill. We we have a, a depth of expertise, and in some ways, the homogeneity of the industry dampens that. You know, if you mm. some of the things that are doing this, you know, just, just doesn't allow that uh, innovation, and technology is improving enormously. So I would, I would keep the challenge and the bar high. I guess that's the challenge where every, if it's a homogeneous top 10, how do you spur that? To the points before, are the 11 to 15 to 25 the only ones playing in that space to actually yeah. get in the top 10? Like you've, you've got to mm. yeah, keep the bar high. Yeah. No, and we do see that the envelope is going to exponentially go forward with, with data and um, the use of um, um, algorithms and the like to better understand the needs of mm. members going forward. I've got data scientists in the investment team that work with me. <laughs> I've got actuaries. These, these people are really skilled at getting at it. It's amazing, like uh, 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 an investment team and suddenly a data scientist arrives and you just change your mindset. It, you know, you can unlock it. It's, again, our data is not perfect and, and there's a bit of hair pulled out at times by the data scientists, but you know, the only way is to set the bar high and allow the industry to run at it. Mm. If, if you don't do that, then they won't do it themselves. And, and given mm. QSuper does have this sort of homegrown advantage of given your membership, you, you do have a little bit more than the, the vanilla data points on your members. Is, is that a constraint to other funds? 
Brad going forward in terms of being able to push that envelope that we're talking about, or? Well, it may be. I mean, I, it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. There's nothing particular about Q Super that really causes um, us to have better access to these things. I think it's the philosophy that's been brought to bear, and I don't mean only in our um, investment in life cycle funds. The financial planning that was done at QSuper was done very early. Our work around insurance has been early and innovative. We've, we've got our own insurance subsidiary. All of these things stem from a culture and a philosophy of trying to understand the member. Now, it was QSuper somehow encouraged or advantaged? It might have been, but I can tell you that mm -hmm. the philosophy is pervasive and it springs from that. Mm -hmm. um, what you're doing in general is attempting to, to focus, um, rationalise and raise the bar in the industry. Just be clear about the criteria you're looking for and data and understanding of the member has got to be central to it. You've said it yourselves. Mm -hmm. Just on insurance, and I know it's not something you raised in your opening remarks, but we know that you've done a lot of mm -hmm. work around insurance, including having ownership sure. um, in substance and form of, of, of insurance products for your members. Sure. Um, our recommendations and, and findings around insurance, did, did any of those agree, disagree, or oh, any I think issues with we, them? We are one of the ones that does have IP as, as, as an opt-out, so... We take our trustee and fiduciary duties seriously and when we go and reviewed, we went and reviewed our insurance proposition, we talked to all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, we went internationally and worked on, on trends about what people are looking for in terms of holistic claims management, believing in the philosophy that getting a member back to work is good for their retirement outcome. Yep. So you can see that in our product design, talking to unions and employers about what they're best for. Um, in terms of rehabilitation. So they're the things that we sort of put into our insurance product. I guess in terms of the findings, in terms of multiple accounts, I guess that's how you do it. So for example, you might have multiple accounts in QSuper, I know that's just a dynamic, but we count it as an individual member. So we take into account our data to actually make recommendations on that. Mm -hmm. we, we concur that there might be people with multiple insurance covers across the board. Um, but I do think some of the things in the ISWG and the multiple account um, um, issues that are being resolved do resolve the majority of those. So we don't we don't have, I guess, an, a strong adverse finding against those. Mm -hmm. and, and we do understand, and indeed it was really well articulated by one of the inquiry participants, um, was it John Beryl in Sydney? Yes, about yeah. income protection. Yes. It's got quite a good link to the objectives of, of, of retirement incomes in superannuation. Is your policy in the default for income protection, is that for a two-year period? Um, it has been for two years. In the last couple of years, we moved that to three years. Okay. So, um, again, based upon what our members and employers, but also the trends in the industry about do you give a member a lump sum? When are they mm. totally and permanently retired? If that's a 25 or a 30-year-old, yeah. how mm. can you actually enable them? Is the best thing for that member to get a lump sum at that point yep. Yep. or to actually find it? So, this, so some of the, it, there is some, just like most practices, there is some science behind why you actually yep. do that. We do offer flexibility, sure. I would say. Um, they can choose 65 or, or waiting periods that they yep. choose. Yeah. And um, when you put a case to your trustee board on what the insurance policy should be for default um, product, yep. um, is there that element of um, the business case also includes the trade-off between... Yes, they do. The value for money is about the trade-off with the, what, what impact it has for retirement balance? A absolutely. So we, that was one of the criteria that we've used for many, many times. So, And that will differ depending on the cohort of membership as well. Yeah. So it's well publicised that things like emergency services would probably value insurance more than others. But we do look at the erosion of the retirement well, balance. We have a dashboard which um, converts the lifetime asset strategy into a retirement income outcome. So the stress testing and the risk is measured in terms of stability of retirement outcome, not asset Asset's returns. One of the elements on that dashboard, we'd be happy to show it to you, yep. is insurance premiums. So we can stress test it, we can actually quantify it. Um, it's not a, sig a major contributor, mm. but um, you know, it's one of those things, if we start to capture it, and you start to look at it and people like me see it, you start to respond. What gets measured gets managed. So our dashboards, internal dashboards, have all of that on it. 
and um, again, imperfect, and it's a learning curve, but those that follow us in down the track, it's just going to be second nature to ask that very question. We see insurance as a lifetime continuum. People insure against dying, and then they insure against living. <laughs> It's all there in our <laughs> modelling, right? Which is oh, I know which side I'm getting on now. <laughs> yeah, well, but if you think about it in that, as we do, absolutely, it's, yeah. just, it's just all one challenge, right? If you consider it a member for life, and then you look at the risks, not asset base risk, but income yeah. risks, yeah. protection risks, then yeah. you do have a different. So we would design. be interested in getting a better understanding of what you've done there. I guess the thing is, we've wanted the trade-off to be better understood by the member. We talked about sure. an online calculator. Mm. Given you guys have done some work in that area, it would be good to get some feedback in, in terms of is that workable and if so, what would be the best way to do it? Um, not that we, we yeah. should be overly prescriptive. Mm -hmm. It's no. up to a fund to work out the best way to do it for their members, but we want to give some yeah. guidance as to what we're trying to get out of it. And I think there's some, some constraints already with the, um, the class order around calculators and so on, and that's yeah. the same thing that people raise mm -hmm. with the, the mm -hmm. SIPA sort of debate about Yep. Where that line between information and advice is, so I think. Yep, we got some. We got some findings in that area as well. Yeah. Working yeah. with the industry to find the balance between that, because that's about yeah. informed decision making. Mm. So how can we find? Uh, my comment before about getting yes, it's good having products, but if if individuals don't know how to use them for their benefit, mm. um, yeah. we need to do better at that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have anything on just lastly anything to say about? Sippers and where you're going with those and how you feel about the mandatory offering and yeah we're still developing our case to be honest we've been looking a lot at the um, you know the development of the accumulation space because that's been unclear as we've seen we're sympathetic with the broad goal we think the design of the sipper as it stands could be improved um, as a chief investment officer I would not like to undertake the challenge of producing a SIPR in this period or any other. We, have, we had worked in parallel with alternatives and perhaps we're biased, but we thought the alternatives that we were developing were probably superior to a SIPR. Um, again, a little more complex, but longevity and those sorts of things. So the, the SIPR seems to be a good start. It's a good, it's a good start, but I would be very disappointed if the industry couldn't come up with something a bit better. And, um, you know, so we would probably be a little critical um, and we are not yet going, you know, to launch a SIPA or design a SIPA. We'd like to see a bit more debate about it. Mm -hmm. okay. and but it's a problem. We've got to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And the notion, Brad, though, of, of it being like a soft default, like a My Retirement product, we flagged that we, we have some reservations about that, uh, albeit they're probably not as well informed as, as many mm. of the industry participants might have about it, but yeah. what's, what's your thought on that? The evidence we have is that our members at and are approaching and, and through their retirement all unilaterally almost start to choose. They, they, are, they become involved and they start to make choices and you have to respect that. I've seen sort of the my retirement concept or the SIPA concept as being an obligation on the trustees to perhaps put in the, in, into it, into the world, a product or a system or a service that would, rec that would recognise their best thinking and maybe then members do, it's not sort of nudging them into it, they might actually be led by it and say, do that make sense? Um, but I, I doubt that we, we have no plans to offer a default or a, a soft default just yet, mm -hmm. but these things are swirling around. We'd be happy to share the debate with you but it wouldn't be conclusive. Wouldn't yeah, and I guess we, we're using our data or what members do at perceived retirement as well. So yeah. there's a lot of our members that continue in the yeah. in that accumulation phase style account long yeah. after we would think that we are retired. So that's, that compulsion at times and dates around what is retirement is a challenge. Likewise funding, it's a, an assumption that people get at the end and they've got a lump sum to contribute to a product. Yeah. If people are making choices beforehand, how they fund into those products mm -hmm. and the longevity is, is just a bigger um, issue yeah. as what am I going to do with the lump sum of the yeah. end. We're often surprised by this data. We had, would accept our invitation to have a look at it and walk mm -hmm. through it. The actions of people in retirement is, is interesting. I mean, it, it really is interesting. It may not be totally rational, but it's modelable and we see a lot of, 
of consistencies in what they do. Mm. We've, of course, as you, you know, we are very strong advocates and we have, right, we're right now trying to uh, split by gender. So we split up men and women. Where they are different and where they are similar is, mm. is it's, you know, we all look at it and go, and you, you look at it two or three or four times and you start to see patterns in it and rationality in it. Rationality. And so, you know, we are encouraged by that. Yes. Because we think the more patterns we can see, the more rationality, the more easy it will be. Mm. Mm. That continuous journey to, again. Yeah, to tailor for that. To, yeah. to just start to learn and start to adapt. I, I don't want to, you know, overstate our ability to do that, but there's certainly a desire to do it. Mm. Okay. I think we've covered a lot mm. of very good we ground have. here this we afternoon. And Thank you. So, unless there's anything else that you wanted to say that we haven't allowed you to get to? Um. No, no I, I think you've invited us to, to give you our best thinking and, um, and you know, we, I think you understand the spirit of what we're saying, you know, set the bar high and, and allow innovation to lead the industry as opposed to perhaps settling for something a bit second best. Right. Risk adjusted versus the risk, risk adjusted, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, absolutely. You, you've sort of demonstrated what we're looking for: possibility um, and realizing that perfection yeah, shouldn't get in no, the way no. of it. And, and likewise, absolutely. not just in the, in in life cycle no. investment options yeah. as well. That, that yeah. applies to your entire investment philosophy. That risk adjusted return. Yeah, yeah. I can feel a technical roundtable <laughs> coming on. But the team's not going <laughs> to throwing things yeah, at no, us shortly. I mean, we're, 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 um, well, we, I'm sure we'll love it because, again, it's yeah. both, you know, right? Well, I'm, well, I bet you we'll learn something. I think sure. we might have to have you in, come visit us again in Melbourne, Q Super, sure. please. Alrighty. Thank not, you so much. Not in the middle of winter, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. All right.
We'll resume our hearings here in um, Brisbane. Um, our next participant um, is uh, going to join us by phone. Um, so I'll just check the technology is working and I'm hoping that uh, uh, Matthew Ungland from BT Financial Group is on the line. We are, thank you, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, I heard a royal we. Is there anyone else with you, Matthew, who will be hoping to speak this afternoon? Uh, so it's Lucas McKay off here as well. Terrific. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you so much for being able to join us. I know that it's um, a, a busy time and you've been able to sort of squeeze us into your, your schedule and, and being flexible about doing this by phone while we're in Brisbane doing the final um, uh, public hearings for our inquiry. Just for the purposes of the transcript, if you could just each say your name and organisation that you represent, and then if you'd like to make some brief opening remarks, we can then head into some, some Q&A. Uh, thank you. Matthew England, BT Financial Group. Lucas McKay, BT Financial Group. So uh, thank you, Deputy Chair Chester and Commissioner McRae for the opportunity to appear today, albeit by phone. Uh, BT would like to also thank the Productivity Commission's team for their detailed consideration and evidence-based assessment of the superannuation industry in all of its complexity. I imagine this was no simple task. BT would like to be on record to say it supports the Commission's key recommendations. One, that an informed and engaged membership base should be the goal for all participants in the superannuation system. Two, that the government should establish an expert panel to select the best in show funds to help guide or nudge consumer choice. Three, that the expert panel should sit outside of the industrial relations system. And four, that consumers should only default once and then take their funds with them between jobs until such time as they choose otherwise. It is well known that until now BT has supported an open market model in which any APRA approved My Super product was free to compete for default status. We have been concerned that an independent body responsible for selecting default funds is potentially susceptible to political influence. The PC's report, however, provides compelling analysis and has led BT to conclude that a different model is necessary to protect consumers from identified negative policy outcomes of account duplication, causing balance erosion, and the defaulting of consumers into underperforming incumbent default funds. BT also recognises that the Commission's report breaks new ground in what is an otherwise tired political debate around default superannuation, and it therefore presents a unique opportunity for the different industry sectors and both sides of politics to agree a bipartisan model. I'd like to use this opportunity to call on the industry to put the interests of consumers first. BT has moved from its entrenched position, and we would encourage others to also give the Commission's recommendations genuine consideration. Debate should now focus on how best to implement the, condition, the Commission's recommendations. The weight of evidence presented by the Commission is compelling. If its recommendations are implemented, consumers would save $3.9 billion each year. BT does, however, note that the implementation of the Commission's recommendations is not without its challenges. Important questions remain to be answered, including how do we ensure the expert panel remains genuinely independent and only selects the funds on the basis of merit? What are the criteria that the panel will apply when selecting those funds? How do new products or new market entrants compete? And should the criteria and assessment be prospective to ensure future tender processes remain competitive? These challenges, however, are not beyond the Commission and Parliament to solve. For example, government panels and boards, such as the Foreign Investment Review Board and the Future Funds Board of Guardians, consistently navigate the potential conflicts of interest inherent in any commercial tender process that requires expert assessment. Further, objective criteria that assesses different products on a like-for-like -like basis are a feature of every tender in both the public and private sector. And in this context, BT would welcome the opportunity to enhance the design of our My Super product, capturing the illiquidity premium for our members that comes from default status. We would also welcome the capacity to configure our My Super products to the lower distribution costs inherent in the government providing a free distribution network and to leverage our significant scale to deliver a more efficient product than incumbent funds. Until the benefits of incumbency are equally accessible to all market participants tendering for a position in the top 10, 
it's difficult for any player in the sector to genuinely claim they outperform the market on a like-for-like -like basis. BT has continued to take a leadership position in the superannuation industry and we, would, we are confident we'd be a strong contender for our top 10 listing. To name a few recent initiatives, BT was a founding participant and adopter of the insurance and super code of practice. BT has had a majority of independent directors and an independent affair on all of its trustee boards. And this week, BT announced that we will rebate to customers of BT Financial Advice grandfathered conflicted remuneration that acts as a drag on the performance of legacy products. We already offer some of the lowest wholesale cost arrangements in the marketplace to employees of large companies. And BT has taken the initiative to rationalise our legacy products, which are often targeted as proof of poor performance. In fact, by June 2020, we plan to have rationalised three superannuation trustees to one, six super funds to one, and by consequence have moved half a million members into contemporary and market-leading products. BT is also calling on the government to help the industry to become more efficient by removing barriers to allow us to rationalise products where, where we are currently legal and able to do so, such as where there are social security or tax impediments. Soon there will be a generation of Australians who will contribute 12% of their income to superannuation for their entire working lives. And BT is conscious that if the industry is to continue to be trusted with the responsibility of managing these Australians' retirement savings, consumers must be able to have absolute faith that we have designed the most efficient superannuation system possible. Thank you, and I'd welcome any questions you may have. Um, very concise but, um, but, but, but broad um, opening remarks. Uh, we might start first then with, um, I guess, the, the twin problems as we identified in the system were those of unintended multiple accounts and entrenched underperformance. On the unintended multiple accounts, I note that you'd identified um, uh, a support for our default once unless a member chooses to, to move to another fund or another um, uh, MySuper product. Um, the other option that's been put to us since releasing our draft report um, by a couple of inquiry participants, and it, and it is another way of um, um, preventing unintended mul multiple accounts from, from emerging with, from new job entrants, is uh, the balance rollover or sort of the, the auto consolidation model going forward, um, where yeah. instead of the member account attaching to the member as they go through their working life, and we know from the modern workforce context that as m when members do change jobs, more than half of them change industry sector and thus unintended multiple accounts will only grow in, in, um, in, in number going forward unless we just to stop them from being created. Um, Inst instead of it being the member account attaching to the member, the, the balance attaches to the member, so the member takes that balance with them um, and uh, to, to every sort of fund or default product um, that's on offer at their next uh, port of call for a job. It'd be good for you to sort of talk us through whether or not you've had a chance to, to think about um, that as another option to solving the agreed problem of, of unintended multiple accounts from arising and whether you see that there are any sort of pros and cons around the second option. Yeah, thank you. It, it is early days in, in our thinking on this one, uh, but I would make a couple of comments. Uh, the first thing is that as a system and as a community, uh, it's beholden upon all of us to actually work towards uh, helping consumers develop long-term relationships and a clear engagement and focus with superannuation. We all know that, that, that people are better off where they're deeply engaged and invested in something which is such an important asset for them long-term. So that's the first comment. Uh, the second comment I'd make is that currently over, as the Commissioner has pointed out, over 2 million unintended accounts are created every single year. The, the risk of moving uh, the balance with the member when they change jobs is in fact that we further entrench the issue of disengagement. So one of the things that that model would need to think about how it overcame is how we have helped shift back to the consumer a desire to participate fully and early in an informed and educated way with the very asset that's going to help make sure that they have a meaningful and enjoyable retirement. The risk of a process where it simply follows the member around is that in fact it, it, so it serves primarily to continue the disengagement. The second challenge that that model would need to think about how it overcame is 
the way in which funds would then think about the longevity of the relationship with the member and the level of investment that they would place in the engagement uh, that they attempt to do. We know through our own experience that members want to be informed and engage more often with their superannuation fund. We know that uh, being able to see their superannuation, a great asset for them on their phone or via an app, is really important. We know that members make more informed choices when they're engaged or communicated with more regularly by their super fund. The question would be, in an environment where there's an expectation that the client will move at their next job, how much super funds would be prepared to invest or, in fact, able to invest in building a relationship which we know is good for the member. Okay, thanks. thanks, Matthew. Um, indeed, I, I sort of take it from your, your opening remarks that the BT is clearly positioning yourself going forward to, 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 to run for the best in show list. Indeed, it sounded like a little bit of a, a, an early dress rehearsal uh, in terms of, you know, the aspirations and plans that BT has going forward to be able to establish their credentials to a best in show process. A couple of thoughts there. So firstly, the issue of um, the, the selection and appointment of the expert panel. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, but yesterday Commissioner McRae and I decided to, to dare a little greatly and, and kite fly an idea on how we could try to depoliticise the appointment of that expert panel with a selection committee that could be not construed as anything but independent. Um, you know, chaired by statutory appointees that might be familiar with the financial system and investments world, so sort of chaired by the, the, the Governor of the Reserve Bank. I, I don't know if you're aware that we, we floated that idea, um, and, and if so, if you've had time to, to think about it in terms of addressing some of the concerns of folk about it being a politicised process. Yeah, I certainly have, and, uh, and again, whilst it's early, I'd make a couple of comments. Uh, the first, I'm not sure that the, uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, will be all that comfortable being called Caesar's wife, as I think you did in your early engagement, uh, Caesar's wife needing to be above reproach, but nonetheless. Um, I think that this process actually needs to start with an agreement of the skills required to do the job. I was heartened to see in the Commission's report very clear articulation that trustees of funds needed to have a very clear view on the skills required to run that fund uh, and that every year and regularly there needed to be a publication of a matrix, the matrix of skills and the way in which independent directors came together to deliver on the skills required to run that fund. I think the first step in this process is to ensure that the panel which actually selects the funds follows the same process. Uh, so publication and debate on the skills required, uh, the eminence of the individuals required to complete this very important task, I think is the first important step. Uh, the second then is to ensure that the uh, appointment process is transparent to all Australians. Uh, and by doing so, I agree that uh, the use of somebody like uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank and others who are appointed by government but independent of, uh, I think is an, an, an issue that is certainly worthy of uh, further consideration and merit. It does, it does help to depoliticise. Uh, the third comment I would make is that independent of that process, uh, the, the, the process for managing of conflicts uh, must be clear and unambiguous. But the thing that I'd say over all of this is that actually this isn't the first time that government and members like ourselves have actually had to consider this. I mean, the government does this today in the way in which it constitutes things like the Foreign Investment Review Board or the Guardians of the Future Fund. These are problems that are not, uh, that are not within, without being in the realms of, of parliament and experts to be able to solve. And so we're fundamentally of a view that this is... This is an important process, but it's only one part of the process and we should ensure that we, we come back to concentrating on ensuring quality outcomes for more Australians. Um, th thanks for that, um, Matthew. I guess that part of the purpose of our inquiry will be to give government um, guidance around supporting our recommendations in our final report on what we would see as being um, the skill set that would, would be required of the expert panel. We've got some initial suggestions in our draft report, so we're looking at hearing back from inquiry participants 
on that proposed skill set and, and whether we've got the sort of the mix of that right and whether we need to be uh, more prescriptive. So we wouldn't be contemplating a, a further round of consultation post our, our final report unless that's something that the government felt was, was merited um, because we'd be quite keen for the government to as we always are at the Productivity Commission, quite keen for the government to just get on with implementing our recommendations if they think that they are of merit. Um, so that's something that we'd be looking at getting feedback from, uh, from BT and from um, other funds and uh, representative organisations, but also organisations that represent the interests of, of members, and we've heard from some of those as well. Um, on the other point that you raised about the selection criteria that would be applied by the expert panel in choosing the best in show. Again, we've got about a page in our report which is relatively high level, but it does sort of set out um, what sort of criteria we would see the panel applying. Indeed, we've had some very good feedback from inquiry participants today about um, how the best in show could also be a way of also um, allowing the expert panel to, to reward uh, the good innovation and endeavour of the truly top performing funds. And, Partly that would be through, you know, net investment returns. But what gets you to net investment returns is the smarts of the investment folk within a fund that not only understand markets and get asset allocation right and getting choice fund managers right and getting costs and fees low, but also get product innovation right to make sure that members when they retire have the largest retirement balance, but then after retirement they have access to good products that make sure that the, those retirement balances um, help them to manage the risks they face in retirement, but also get good retirement income streams or, or access to, to sort of good um, drawdown as, as needed. So the other thing we're looking for then is feedback um, on the criteria that the expert panel should be uh, providing, uh, should be applying in deciding best in show. So we would welcome in a post-draft report submission from BT, um, if um, we've already been setting homework for others and, and we, we'd like to do the same for you. Of our final report. Um, yes, sure. We, we, we lost you a minute for a minute there. If I can make just a few quick comments on that, we'd absolutely love to uh, uh, further allude uh, to our answer in the submission. Uh, what I would say is that, um, as per what the Commission has put forward, uh, member outcomes we believe are fundamentally important. We're very big on governance and we welcome the opportunity to comment more as we do submit our report on that. We believe that governance is a crucial criteria. Uh, we think that insurance uh, coverage and sustainability is something that will be incredibly important uh, for the future for the future model and importantly also engagement of members. And in thinking about all of those things, uh, and I, I like uh, Commissioner, uh, your comments, we believe that fundamentally uh, the criteria need to both look backwards, so be retrospective, but have a really important focus and lens on the prospective. Um, that will allow uh, industry participants and competition amongst the industry to drive innovation. It will allow uh, members like ourselves who are looking to participate in the top 10 to think about how we would consider a product structure and product design that's fit for the cohort that comes with participating in the, the top 10 uh, and think about the cost structure that's associated with that and would allow us to continue to drive innovation and engagement with both our existing members and importantly those that would come. So we welcome the opportunity to, to put that in our submission. That would be most welcome. Um, just touching on another, a couple of other things that you commented on, um, you referenced, and, and I may, may have misunderstood this, so it'd be good for you to expand on a little bit, um, the, 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 the best in show resulting in um, someone becoming best in show, uh, then being able to project some uplift in their performance going forward from the illiquidity premium. Just talk us through a little bit what you meant by that, Matthew. Uh, so there are, sorry, Minister, uh, Commissioner, there are a couple of things that uh, come from this. The, the first, in terms of participating in the top ten, uh, would, as it does for default funds today, guarantee cash flows for participants in the top ten. Uh, what that allows individual participants to do is to access different asset classes and by consequence invest differently with different investment horizons. And we see that with some market participants today. Uh, the second thing that uh, this process would enable is that participation in the top 10 actually shifts 
potentially the cost of acquisition and importantly the cost to serve and what that would enable us to do what that would enable participants to do is to think about how they shift their operating cost model to actually deliver back additional returns to members so not only are you accessing additional asset classes not only is the cost of delivery or acquisition potentially lower and the cost to serve spread over a broader client base, but all of that then contributes to being able to offer back to members that outcome through enhanced investor services and improved investor returns. I'm sure that that's something that um, if we get the right expert panel, they can test the efficacy of those claims when it comes to choosing best in show if people are going to ascribe an investment performance uplift from accessing the liquidity premium. I'd just be mindful that we do set out in our report the sort of the the, distrib the, um, the inflows that would flow to the best in show, given that it's new job entrants, switching and re-entrants, and all up, unless we see a, an exponential change in switching rates, it's about $20 billion of the $150 billion of new contributions each year that flow into the system. So anyway, we would leave it up to the expert panel to judge the efficacy of that, but by all means, in, in your post-draft report submission, if you wanted to set out the evidence base, as you said, we, we would find that of interest and of value in terms of what guidance we might provide to the expert panel in terms of the selection criteria. The other thing, Matthew, that you touched on was around um, making sure that the best in show was an open show for new entrants. And I take it to that you mean new entrants to the Australian superannuation system. Um, so we do have an information request around that in terms of wanting to make sure that uh, the, the, the expert panel would be able to, and, and if we get the right expert panel, they should be able to do this readily, look at uh, an investment track record um, of another institutional investor, wherever they may reside in the world, if they're looking at coming to Australia and, and competing for best in show. Um, um, and, and again, investment track record is, is one of a number of, um, of uh, uh, <coughs> criteria that would apply, but we want to just make sure that there are no barriers to entry if there are good institutional investors that do want to come to Australia and, and compete for best in show in the, um, in, in the superannuation system. That information request was a little bit broader than we'd anticipated. Um, we did also allow it to contemplate um, uh, a possible entrant to that system being a, a, a government uh, run or a government-owned fund. Um, that was not something that we'd sort of thought we would sort of contemplate, but it's been put to us during the course of this inquiry, perhaps not directly, but, well, directly by some um, academic experts, um, Professors Barr and Diamond, who are very well respected in the field, albeit um, a lot of their experiences in, in pension systems, in very different sort of pension systems to what we have here in Australia. Um, but it was certainly raised in the, the, the media in Australia as, as a potential idea. We, we've put it forward in terms of not a monopoly default, but um, a, a government fund perhaps being able to compete for access to the best in show. So it'd be good to get your, your thoughts on that information request either now or in the form of your, your post-draft report submission. I think that would be one that we would take on notice. I, I thought you might say that, and sensibly yep. so on a Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other what, thing I, what I would, if I, if I could, uh, Commissioner, what I would like to say is in regards to uh, new entrants, we also shouldn't discount the opportunity for existing entrants to rethink the way in which they would look to serve the constituent that would be available to in the marketplace as a result of participating in the top ten. So I think the process for inclusion, the process for consideration will drive considerable innovation right across the market. We've heard that, that thematic very clearly from some inquiry participants a little bit earlier this afternoon in, in our hearings. And um, I, again, it then comes to the criteria that the expert panel would be applying, and, and you know, an expert panel would want to make sure that they've demonstrated evidence that's provided by um, participants in the, the best in show selection process. Um, you touched on before um, barriers to rationalising mm -hmm. products. Um, given we're in a world where we've identified a bunch of products that perhaps going forward or even historically may not be in the best interests of members, it'd be good to understand what you see as the existing impediments to, um, to rationalising of those products or sort of cleaning up products such that going forward um, the products are much more suitable to, to the members? 
so look, Lucas I, McKay. It's Lucas McKay here. We'll take that on, on notice and put it in the submission. We've certainly made submissions to government in the past, but there, there's two broad categories of issues. There are some tax... Uh, sorry, there's three. There's some tax impediments, and government often um, introduces CGT relief to support that. Um, there's also um, issues in the CIS definition uh, when you're trying to merge entities and, and the test and the benchmark is quite high around trying to make sure that um, most, if not all, aspects of the member's benefit is improved. Um, and so we, we've submitted on that previously, so we'll, we'll include those thoughts in, um, in our written submission. There can be um, social security issues, but that's mostly in the um, retirement space for old products that um, are now closed. We'd heard from APRA that um, they'd given new guidance around the equivalence test there, so we'd need to sort of get some evidence as to how that, um, that guidance and the equivalence test may still not be going far enough in, in removing those impediments. So that, so that would be really helpful to, to get that in your, in your submission. Um, the other thing, and I'm very careful, well, we, we're very careful to believe what we read in the papers, but we did read in the papers that um, BT had made a decision around trailing commissions. Is that reporting uh, yes, correct? That is yeah, that, that is correct. So uh, earlier this week, uh, Brad Cooper, the CEO of BT Financial Group, uh, confirmed to the marketplace that uh, uh, for uh, the BT Financial Advice business, so our salaried financial advisors, uh, from the 1st of October 2018, where any grandfathered trailing commission uh, is currently um, uh, connected to products that uh, the clients of that advice group are using, that those uh, trailing commissions would be turned off and would be um, uh, placed at the benefit of, or to the net benefit of, uh, the some 140,000 account holders that are part of that financial advice network. So I note you were very careful in how you explained how that would apply. Does that mean that going forward, once that's implemented, BT would then have no trailing commissions in superannuation products? The, uh, the entity in question is our financial advice business, and our financial advice business is in a position where it has been able to go to the marketplace, our salary financial advice business, been able to go to the marketplace and ask all market participants that it interacts with to turn off trailing commission. Uh, BT, as a, as a parent entity, has legal contractual obligations with other licensees, other advice businesses, which at this stage um, mean that trail commissions from our products would continue to be paid to those. We have made the offer uh, to the marketplace that where advisors or licensees believe it's in their client's best interest to uh, also um, uh, follow BT's lead that we would welcome the opportunity to work with them on that. And that kind of makes sense to us, um, given we didn't go as far on trailing commissions in our draft report because we'd understood that there would be perhaps some contractual barriers for, for folk like yourself to actually implement that across all of your products, uh, where you've got financial advisor arrangements in place historically. So on what you've announced, if it's just your salaried financial advisors, what percentage of your products that then have trailing commissions will have trailing commissions? I'm just trying to understand. From our perspective, it's not what BT has done, although we welcome the removal of trailing commissions when you can do so. It's just trying to understand what are the barriers to removing trailing commissions going forward, getting rid of the historical legacy of them. So, so understanding what percentage of the problem you were able to solve or, or the removal of trailing commissions through the salaried financial advice compared to those where you've got other contractual arrangements that you can't undo. I'll need to take uh, that question on notice, Commissioner, in terms of the percentage of the overall uh, BT uh, superannuation portfolio or the, or the book. Um, what I will say in terms of uh, barriers to execution, you're right in terms of the contractual obligations. What BT is doing uh, is looking to rationalise and simplify all of its product structures. We've always been a supporter of making sure there is transparency uh, for all fees charged to clients such that clients can make informed decisions about the value of financial advice and we are big supporters of the value of financial advice. Uh, and as we continue to rationalise our product suite uh, for our superannuation entities, that will continue to be a focus. 
So of your financial advisors in-house and external, so the externals I'm assuming are the ones that you have contractual obligations that you can't undo, the in-house being your salaried financial advisors, what's the percentage across all your advisors of, of the in-house folk that are salaried that you've got control over what you can do versus the external? Uh, the vast majority of advisors who use uh, BT Financial Group's products are not salaried advisors of BT. So they sit in the 10,000 the, the 10, or so uh, financial advisors that are currently operating in the marketplace. Um, so the vast majority are external to the salaried advice network. I, I think a key point. I think a key point is that this is an important change for BT and the way our advice operates. Um, but it'll be up to the rest of the market to decide how it responds, and eventually up for government to decide whether or not it wants to try and cross the bridge around whether or not to make a change here to um, to sunset at some point those folk payments. No, no, and look, and we kind of totally understand, which is why we didn't go further in our draft report because we thought there'd be these contractual mm. barriers. So, in a layman's terms. You've got to convince people that have got contracts in place with you to change those contracts in a way that aren't financially in their short-term best interests. Uh, yeah, that's 100% correct, but I think that's where um, we clearly think advice is going and we support a fee-for-service model so that consumers 100% understand what they're paying for um, and, and it's hyper-visible, so that's the step that we, or the decision that we've made. Yeah, BT was a leader in this uh, at a point in time where uh, FOFA came in. We ensured that all of our clients opted into a process of ongoing fee advice where that was where that was appropriate. There was an opportunity for some to be grandfathered, but we believed transparency and authenticity in uh, delivery of and uh, articulation of value of, of financial advice was crucial. Um, our report also had a bunch of recommendations around insurance. We also appreciate that there was some precursor um, policy decisions made in the budget around insurance, uh, albeit there was quite a bit of overlap. There are some areas where the budget went further and there are some areas where we went further. Um, it'd be good to get your sort of feedback on, on, on those recommendations and findings around insurance and how they might impact BT going forward. So overall, we support uh, the, the moves that are uh, predicated both in your report and in the budget. Um, again, we'll come back to we firmly believe that there is a role for insurance in superannuation. There are many benefits which your report outlines associated with holding of group insurance uh, in superannuation. But we also recognise that the zombie uh, insurance that you call out is a challenge and does erode uh, member benefits and long-term savings. Um, what we need to make sure we continue to focus on is that the pool of insurance is able to manage uh, the, uh, the risk premium that is uh, associated with the marketplace. So if we overtly shrink the pool uh, to a point where it becomes unsustainable, then that will, that will provide some challenging in terms of pricing. So there's more thinking to do there. Uh, but we do agree that um, the insurance uh, particularly where there's a small balance, uh, needs to be a considered choice by consumers. So again, we come back to how do we make sure that we uh, get early and ongoing engagement and informed decision-making uh, by consumers. The thing that we do like is that default once helps. So the process of ensuring that a single default and default for life, unless the consumer chooses to move, uh, we think is a good step in the right direction, um, as is the move to a single active account. Craig here. I, I just had one uh, final question for you. In your opening comments, you talked uh, a bit about some of your internal rationalisation and mergers, and I'm just wondering if you had any yes. comments around um, whether there were any policy impediments to, to external as well as sort of internal merger activity in and how you've seen how that process has worked for you and whether you think there's scope for that, either more scope for it within your own organisation or, and or greater scope, uh, and I mean, you, you can't really speak for others, but the extent to which you could see no. there are opportunities for that um, more broadly across the industry. Yeah, and I, I think um, you know, our, our situation is a little bit different to some of the, the tail of smaller industry funds that you call out. 
Um, and I think we are, we're, we're bringing together three entities, um, but they're a product of uh, merger and acquisitions that have happened in the past. Um, but there certainly are impediments to smaller organisations merging together. There's certainly a, a very large fixed cost in that, that activity to bring the funds together. Um, so, and I, I think you'll find a lot of large funds uh, are reducing their appetite to merge very small funds because of that fixed cost. Um, I don't really have a, an easy answer for you on that one, unfortunately. Okay, look, um, we're probably just about out of time. So um, unless there was anything else you wanted to say that we haven't given you an opportunity for, we'll thank you and um, we'll have to say farewell on the phone. <laughs> but we look forward to getting your post draft report right. submission. <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Oh, Peter, oh. is that you? That's the that, uh, Peter Strong here. Um, right. With Pat McKenzie, my chairman. Okay, Peter, we might just. Uh, are you on a mobile phone somewhere? We are. We're going to a landline. Oh, so this Can is. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's much better. Terrific. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, Peter. It's, it's Karen Chester here, and I'm joined by my colleague, Angela McRae. Um, Thank you. So, Peter, thanks so much for being able to join us this afternoon, and, and we do appreciate it's by phone, which makes life a little trickier. Uh, you are managing to avoid being filmed and, and YouTubed, which is probably um, <laughs> a preference by some, but not of others. Um, if you'd just like to make some, just state for the, um, the purposes of the transcript your name and the organisation you represent, and then if you'd like some, make some brief opening remarks, and then we'll get into Q&A. Thank you. Peter Strong, CEO, Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia. Um, if, uh, I'd just like to make the obvious statement that we don't believe uh, businesses should be involved in the collection process for superannuation. Uh, it, it adds complexity for... Uh, it adds complexity for businesses. It creates a situation where the farmers themselves find it very difficult to manage the payment process and it adds confusion for employees. Uh, it creates an opportunity for the people, uh, bad employers, to uh, keep employee superannuation funds and the, the tax office works out that 95% of employers do the right thing, but that's still 5% of an awful lot of money that isn't going to where it belongs. Uh, and we're saying if we remove employers from the collection process, that a lot of problems will disappear uh, and be resolved. Um, and it, to us, it seems a very obvious solution to being resisted by people who make money out of the collection process. That's my opening statement. It's Angela here. Um, ju just for the purposes of, our, of, of the record here, um, I'm familiar with your preferred model of, of how collection would occur, but it might be worth, just for the record, you running through that just in a couple of sentences, just so that um, we can then have a bit of a discussion about where you'd like to see things go, where we're at, and how things currently operate. OK, thank you. At the moment, uh, the example we like to use is if I pay an employee $100,000 a year, uh, what, I, what I end up doing is uh, paying them $70,000 over the number of pay periods, and then I send $30,000 over that period to the tax office. Uh, then I go and find another $10,000, and I ask my employee where to send that, uh, or uh, I follow the award provision, or I follow the provisions of an enterprise agreement, uh, or I use a superannuation clearinghouse, or perhaps Superstream, and I send that $10,000 somewhere else over a period of, uh, could be four payments, could be 26 payments. Now that 
what we're proposing is that I pay that employee $110,000 and send $40,000 to the tax office and my job is done. It's up to the employee, who is now going to be called an investor, to tell the tax office where to send their retirement funds. Now, the, the benefits of that is uh, to be found in many places. First of all, obviously with an employer, because it removes complexity. Uh, with the employee, it certainly removes that amb- ambiguity of how much money they earn and who owns the money. Uh, a lot of employees, particularly younger people, get very confused about superannuation uh, because it's not presented to them as their wages, it's presented as a superannuation. So having someone understand that they're earning $110,000, it's their money, uh, I think sends a good message. It removes complexity, enormous complexity, for the superannuation funds themselves. So at the moment, uh, the superannuation funds as an industry deal with, say, 800,000 employers. It's a bit less than that, but 800,000 employers on behalf of 14 million employees, probably more, depending on who's got two or three jobs. Uh, That is an awful lot of transactions happening. That's an awful lot of complexity. Uh, the funds also have to keep a record of where employee, where their, their members work. When they change jobs, they have to contact employers. They have to chase employers if the employer has to pay. And they have to obviously transact, do all the transactions on all the payments and inform people who's been paid. Under our proposal, the superannuation funds would deal with one place, not 800000 uh, and they wouldn't ever have to wonder where one of their members worked ever again. That would not be an issue. The money would be held by the tax office until it was told by the person who owns the money where to send it. Does that make sense? Have I described it properly? Or enough just, that you uh, understand? Yeah, I think just that it's very helpful because it just gives us a bit of context then for the discussion. So so what we've, what we've proposed in our... Um, model in terms of the way the default operations would work is that employees would be making the choice rather than employers and if the employee didn't choose then they would be um, put into one of the best in show on a, on a sort of sequential basis among between those top ten. So the first thing we would do is remove the employer from that position of having to make a choice for their employee where the employee doesn't choose. And I suppose just as a starting point, you, we haven't you hadn't mentioned that point. You talked about the mechanism of payment, but do you have a view about the the uh, willingness and and capability, I guess, of employers to make that choice where they need to under the current arrangements? And would you see the employees making the choice as a as a better option? The employee making the choice is a much better option because it's their money. Now, the, my my uh, members are small business and. Very few of them, unless they're in the financial industry, uh, are able to give advice to anybody on which funds to use. Um, and that's always been a problem with the system is that the employer was supposed to select the default fund. And that, that's become complicated over the years. But certainly we shouldn't be getting involved in the financial future of our employees. And that, 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 that would be a good decision to take us out of that process. And would you say, I mean, we, we had it put to us yesterday that there's a lot of things that employers do under rewards that require them to make some choices for their employees, like how much they pay them for their for their uh, for their lunch breaks. I think it was it was it was a, it was a small factor. And then they said, well, if they're only choosing between you know ten funds in an award, that's not such a big deal. Do you think that's that's how employers would see it? Um, well, employers though, wouldn't see it that way at all. And by the way, my chairman, Mark McKenzie, is on, a, a, is on this call as well, and he may he may make comment, but. Again, where we come from is it's nothing to do with us. This is their money, our employees' money, and we, we, we should be able to pay them. Now, one of the proposals is we put we said, well, how about we pay them their money and they put it into the superannuation fund? And, of course, we know that wouldn't happen. So we put the onus back on the employer to fiddle with somebody else's money. I want to point out that everybody in the system of superannuation gets paid for what they do except the small business employer. So... If you work for a big business or a super fund or a public service, whatever it is, you, you get paid as you should. If you're a director on a fund, you get paid as you should. And unless you're a director on rest, where it's like a tuck shop over there, they have volunteers running that, that fund. But besides that, you we don't get paid. We're the only people that can get fined for not doing our job. And Victoria's looking at putting us in jail if we don't do our job as well. 
Now, we want to do our job. We want to pay our employees and follow the tax rules. This superannuation is a different imposition. It's been there for a long time, but now we're saying it needs to be removed because there's a lot of ambiguity about it and it is not transparent for our employees. So if we put it in tax, then these conversations around us nominating funds, us being happier with funds, it wouldn't be a conversation. We wouldn't be involved. There'd probably be 20 Senate inquiries into superannuation that wouldn't have happened and won't happen in the future. The Productivity Commission wouldn't have to investigate superannuation payments. It becomes a non-event. And as I say, the funds themselves would save an awful amount of money in the administration. We shouldn't be involved in someone's financial future by making decisions around it. Now, those 10 funds, uh, that's good. That gives the, the, the person that owns the money the opportunity to, to select one of the funds. But even that's artificial. That's not a marketplace. Um, If we put it in superannuation, they could pick any fund they wished and the funds would actually have to compete. They would have to develop products to suit particular parts of the market. They would develop a product for young people, a product for people approaching retirement, a product for uh, people in regional areas. Who knows? That's where the market would help select the funds. So those 10 funds, probably wouldn't need to exist. Now, we would need a default fund when a person doesn't tell the tax office where where to send their money. So you would need... And it's been suggested to me that the future fund is a place to put that. Commissioner... Sorry, Sorry, uh, Mark Mark would like to make a comment. Commissioner, I suppose coming back to... Just for the record, just for our my name's Mark McKenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. I'm the board uh, chair of COSBOA. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, look, I suppose the question you asked about, you know, what's the difference between providing advice in a small number of funds versus uh, talking about how much you actually pay for a lunch break, I think fundamentally it comes down to the fact that if I'm making a decision in relation to how much I actually pay an employee in terms of entitlements or travelling allowance or compensation with a vehicle, that's part of the employment contract between me and an employee. Uh, When we get into a situation where we're uh, put into the position of almost a pseudo-financial advisor, there's two concerns that arise from an employer perspective. Small businesses don't have the governance practices that larger businesses might have in terms of advising their managers about um, uh, attracting liability, uh, litigating litigation liability on the basis of providing advice that might come back and bite them later on. It's typically a decision they'll make uh, in a bit of a hotbed of trying to run the business at the same time. So I suppose the, the principal concern I'd have to the proposition that's been put in front of us is that if we ended up with the business owner being put in a position where it was providing uh, de facto a, a financial advice on a particular fund, then the, it always opens up a, a potential line of liability in the longer term in that they might have, uh, should have taken reasonable steps to actually ensure that they furnished the employee with a, a disclosure statement that they were not providing financial advice. There's a whole series of things that would need to be put in place to protect that business in the longer term. And they might not be doing the right thing by their employee. But there's also a risk that, and, and I'm not don't want to give you the, um, the suggestion that small businesses always look for, you know, other opportunistic revenue streams. But, you know, there's also a case where you could be open up to, um, you know, potential kickback arrangements and so on that, that business might have with a select number of super funds. And that becomes particularly important if it just becomes a small number of funds. So I, I suppose our, our central proposition here is to say the employer, should, employer and particularly in small business level, should not be in a position of actually directing or advising the employee around their chosen fund for the reasons that we've talked about. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. And, and it, is, it, it helps us with some greater evidence, I think, to support the case that we have made for the employee choice model that, was chosen, that we've chosen uh, in our draft report. And we've looked at the role of employers there, but that's just given us a bit more uh, firmer evidence from the horse's mouth, if you like, on the sorts of issues that we thought... Um, are part of the, the issues that, that bedevil the current default system and, in fact, some of the other default models that we considered in our earlier work. So coming back then to the payment could, issue, which I think you, was the one... Oh, sorry, did you want to say something else there? Uh, no, 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 yeah, um, yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Just on the, the, the payment um, arrangements, uh, and I guess this has been a, a bit of an issue since really since the, the SG began about... Um, 
how to streamline payments. Um, and I can see some, uh, fr from a small business perspective, Peter, the, the model that you've outlined there um, is, you know, has quite some attractions. One, one of the uh, opportunities, I guess, that you might want to think about in responding to our report, um, where, where we're now proposing the centralised online service and the way that it would work is that there would be a requirement for employers and employees to report electronically at the point of entering the workforce and nominating a fund. The employee would nominate a fund at that point and if they didn't, they would be defaulted into one under the arrangements we spoke about previously. So at the point of employment, the ATO would now be advised of the employee and the fund through that form that would come via the employer. But beyond that point then, the ATO would have that information. So I just wonder if we could think a little bit, and we, we haven't gone here in the draft, but thinking creatively about how, particularly for those employers that might already be using a small bus the small business clearinghouse, it might be possible for the ATO to take on the sort of responsibility in the model in the way that you've described it, Peter. So it wouldn't cover everybody, but maybe there's a, there's a way, a mechanism for us to move towards the sort of model you're looking at there. Now we'd need to think about the consequences then for the private sector small business, uh, the private sector clearing houses, and whether they could be brought into that kind of model. But I guess in terms of, we're thinking about a slightly new way of, a new architecture of getting new employees into the system that would give more direct electronic information to the ATO and perhaps we can then be more creative about the way we could potentially reduce the role of employers in that, in that whole mechanism. So it's not something we thought about in any great detail for the purposes of the draft, just given the scope of the work we had to do. But I'd be interested if you could perhaps have a look at that architecture and see if you can think about, and we will too, about the ways we might be able to build on that even if it's not an immediate thing, but to does it work out a design for the future that might reduce the role of employ employers in that space going forward. But in that context, I'd be quite well, interested if you had views about the current role of the small business, the ATO small business clearinghouse and the private sector clearinghouses and how they're the same or different or more innovative or more helpful for em employees in the current environment. But you might want to say something about the more general point in the first place. Yeah, look, uh, what I hear about the clearinghouse, the ATO clearinghouse, is very good. It, it's been positive feedback. The, the, the criticism that there is, and it, it, it's still, you've still got to get in there. You've still got to enter information. You've still got to sit down in your own time, probably Sunday morning, and enter information in there and connect up. Um, you know, and, and I know that some people say it's easy. And whenever people say it's easy, it means they haven't run a business. So we need to just understand that Every extra activity we undertake takes our, our, our eye off the business and off other things. So even getting into the clearinghouse is an issue. The second thing about the clearinghouse is that hasn't stopped the, uh, the superannuation funds from still harassing employers at all. Uh, we've got very recent cases where employers uh, or, or employer representatives, um, bookkeepers, etc., are receiving threatening letters from the funds or from the fund debt collection agency telling them to pay up when, they, when they're paid up. So there's another issue here that, that's really important to us is we have a, an efficient tax office. I don't care what they say on other things, but it's a very efficient tax office that's not perfect. Uh, we have uh, superannuation funds to the private sector, unregulated when it comes to the collection process, that scam um, and threaten small business people all the time through letters uh, because they don't know what they're doing. So we can have a good collection process, but we have a bigger problem in the, in the behaviour of the funds themselves in their uh, inability to, to be good administrators of the payment process. If you were able to give us some evidence of that in a submission, Peter, that would be helpful. Yes, I will, I will organise that. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess the final thing, and it's, it, it, from my point of view, and I'm happy for you to raise other things if you've got them, but um, w we did, uh, we have raised in the report that the $450 threshold for contributions hasn't hasn't uh, been indexed or changed, in fact, since the SG was introduced, so for 25 years, um, and that if that threshold had been indexed, we worked out that, that it would be more like a $1,000 threshold rather than a $450 threshold today. And I just wondered if you had any views on that. I know one of the reasons that had been an issue in the past was that 
the compliance burden, particularly for employers with um, very many uh, employees, or particularly casuals who might be uh, undertaking actions like fruit picking and that sort of thing on a short-term basis on, on low incomes, that they would have very small SG amounts that would be collected, potentially never paid out because the people then move overseas, you know, go back to their home countries or or um, just forget that the money's there once they move on to their first sort of proper job, if I can call it that. Would you, would you have a view on, on whether that threshold should be moved and, and to what extent that might help employers with some of the compliance costs if we weren't able to move to a more streamlined system for employers? Yeah, Mark, Mark the King's words that before I put on the mark, I'll say, I'll say the obvious thing, if you don't ask us to collect super, there will be no threshold. It won't be a discussion point. Uh, but Mark will, will respond to the question. Um, Commissioner, I suppose the, the point, um, our understanding is originally the 450 a month limit was actually determined on the basis of the tax-free threshold, which was about 5,800, I think, from memory. Um, I suppose we'd have a, uh, you know, in asked in terms of where do we think it should actually be pointed, our view would be to actually look at the current tax-free uh, exemption threshold, which I think is about $18,000, and actually uh, turn that to a monthly payment. I suppose the point for us there is to that point, particularly if you're starting to look at a system where you're actually paying tax um, for employees and it's being collected through the tax agent as we're actually proposing, that it doesn't make a lot of sense if you've actually uh, got an employee that has not been identified in terms of any uh, PAYG contributions, but you're actually making a super contribution. So we would see some rationale in aligning it with um, the current uh, tax-free threshold and then turning that into a, uh, a monetised monthly payment. So I think that would work out to be about $1,500. So I think the only other thing I'd just mention, it's Karen Chester here, um, uh, Mark and Peter. I think the only th other thing I'd mention is the other thing that's also changed uh, over the 25 years is the incidence of people now with multiple jobs. So we know that 8% of employees in the workforce today do have multiple jobs. And, and thus for an employer looking at the monthly salary of, of, a, of an individual, they may not know what their total salary would be across more than the one job. So you could end up with the perverse situation of someone on a low income who is still paying tax um, and, and thus perhaps should be paying an SG uh, contribution towards their retirement balance would, would sort of miss out in, in that context. And I, I don't want to overstate um, the order of magnitude of that, but, but that's one other sort of little wrinkle in how we might want to look at adjusting that threshold going forward if the Commission were reminded to do so in its final report. So it'd be good to get your thoughts around that interaction as well. Okay, and just, just building on what you said, I mean, the, the workforce has changed. We've got the so-called gig economy, so there are some people out there who work for maybe two or three different people, then they contract as well, or they run their own business, and it becomes very complicated. And quite often there are young people doing that, so the superannuation isn't high on their agenda. So that that's an issue that's never been considered and in, in getting in the way of the proper collection. We have the issue of people who work for someone for a month here and a month there, and an employer may only employ someone for a month, you never employ someone again. So the system doesn't that is not flexible enough or transparent enough to deal with with what's happening out there in the current workforce. So people are missing out on the super. We should be getting it, uh, and some people are not contributing to super, and particularly the self-employed, who should be contributing it. And again, this is another benefit of putting it into tax: is it forces the self-employed to contribute, and it means you're not looking for superannuation and trying to work work out what that even means for you if you're only employing someone for one month or two months. It removes that that real problem in the area of employment, and for young people in particular. It's not an issue that they're going to think about until they fill out their first tax return or they fill out a tax return once a year and they'll, they'll certainly understand it then. But the, the complexity of, the, of employment at the moment and the complexity of the industrial world, the complexity of a whole range of things is, is a problem for our members. We, we had a meeting yesterday where we talked about the real problem of, of the complexity and the more complexity being developed out there. And so we're actually talking about removing it moving complexity, which everybody will win on. Um, people out, if I can just stress as well, people outside the tax system are going to have to come back into the tax system if they want the superannuation. Uh, the black economy is going to struggle with that. Hang on, Mark's got a comment. 
Um, I suppose but uh, the question that's been asked also um, is one of the reasons why we believe it's the tax office should, who should actually collect it. So if I've got multiple jobs, I'm typically filling in a tax file notification for each of those positions. I can only claim the exemption for the tax-free threshold for one of those positions. So I suppose that the argument we'd actually have here is that uh, if the employee has actually claimed from an employer uh, the tax-free threshold, then that employer who's making contributions below whatever that threshold is would not be collecting PAYG, but the other employers were actually paying it. I mean, this is a, this is a simple... This, for our reason, is, this is our principal reason why we believe it needs to be the tax office, because it's so closely linked to the structure of employment. And so if I have multiple jobs, the only one who really knows uh, how those... Uh, um, jobs are actually accumulating from an income perspective is actually the tax office. So, you know, the, the simple way of actually administering this in terms of either a change of employer and therefore a redirection of funds, because one of the things you'll frequently get as a small business if you lose a staff member is you're being chased for either the last month or the last quarterly super as the fund catches up with the fact that the staff member's actually moved. Similarly, if they've got multiple jobs... Um, the way to, to deal with the issue that's actually been raised is do it on the basis of approaching it the same way we do with PAYG. And so these are very strong reasons. It's not just a, an issue around straight simplicity, but the administrative task in terms of movement of staff uh, and employment in multiple jobs and administration of that threshold on multiple jobs because I'd argue the same issue applies now that for each of the employees who are sitting below the current 450 level, I could still have three or four jobs and that same person is missing out. Um, if you go down a process of actually saying, well, I'll exempt you from the first job if you're below that threshold, beyond that, I'm actually capturing it all. Great. No, well, look, that's been very helpful. Um, so I think we're, uh, we're pretty much out of time. So unless there's something that you else you wanted to raise before we finish, we'll thank you for that and look forward to your uh, submission when you can get to it, hopefully, before, on or before the 13th of July. Yep. You, you will keep my submission. So, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. inquiry participant <laughs> for Brisbane but also for our public hearing so we're as relieved as you are Michael <laughs> <laughs> so so welcome and, and thank you for being so patient um, uh, through our earlier inquiry participants this afternoon um, and welcome um, uh, so if you could just state your name and organization that, that, that sure, you work Michael, with or represent Michael Drew professor of finance Griffith University great Michael, if you'd like to make some brief opening remarks, sure. that would be appreciated, and then we can get into some, some discussion. Uh, look, as an economist, I understand uh, the incentives I'm working <laughs> under in terms of you and three days of hearing, so um, <laughs> I understand completely. Um, I think for the record, it's important to state um, I'm a director at Drew Walk & Co. Uh, I am a member, a specialist member of the investment committee at QSuper Limited, and I'm a member of the investment advisory board of the Petroleum Fund of Timor-Leste, which is the sovereign wealth fund for East Timor. Um, thanks again to the Commission and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you at this public, important public hearing um, this afternoon. Uh, I started my journey in super uh, in 1997 as a, a newly minted doctoral student reading um, for my degree in this new area of investment performance around superannuation. So it was a new field and I suppose I was at the right place at the right time. Our research findings over the past two decades have highlighted the challenges of benchmarking and evaluating the performance of single and multi-asset investment vehicles, particularly those we deal with in superannuation. Good governance demands that best practice evaluation in undertaking a timely, robust and in a defensible way to ensure the interest of fund members is paramount. But we'd also stress in our submission um, with Professor Robert Bianchi and Dr Adam Walk from the Griffith Business School that good performance evaluation is something more than just the inputs, something more than just manager returns and asset class returns. It really is about, has, the, has this sort of strategy been accretive to the outcome? And this is something we've been on the public record here and in the United States debating, and, and in parts of Europe around the world, the importance of framing regarding money or dollar-weighted returns, outcomes, versus <coughs> returns, time-weighted returns, which are an input to the outcome. 
we think this framing is so vital, in fact, that much energy actually goes into a debate that at times, whilst important, is a second order debate. Um, I played a lot of cricket at school. I was a fantastic opening batsman. Um, my average was 23 and we didn't win a game. <laughs> the reason I tell that story a lot, both in our research and the work we do with industry, is that sometimes there's a flaw in averages. And we need to be very clear that we're setting up success in this business, that we're thinking about outcomes, particularly money or dollar-weighted outcomes, that actually affect things like a member's adequacy risk, longevity risk, and all the other risks that we, we, we're going to talk about today. So we, we commend and support um, the key findings of the Productivity Commission's review. It's been multi-stage, it's been a long mm -hmm. process for you, and we commend you and your colleagues for the journey that you've been on. We absolutely support a greater emphasis on in, an individual superannuation outcomes, that is the, the money weighted, the actual dollar weighted return, rather than the disproportionate energy that's allocated to inputs, time weighted returns. In my life, I have my university, my school, my hospital. <laughs> there is a range of these things in, in, in life, and this is one that we have to get right um, for the sake of our members. We also support your initiatives around fundedness and thinking about perhaps uh, the dashboard incorporating things like retirement wealth ratios, annuity equivalent values, how these deal with inflation risk. Um, risk in its fullest form, not simply volatility <laughs> or standard deviation, but what's the probability of this strategy falling short of the objective? If it does fall short, by how much? What's the drawdown risk? So having a holistic conception of what risk is through the life stage. Being clear on language, target date funds versus the next generation of life cycle funds, static approaches to default settings rather than dynamic outcome oriented approaches to default settings. And um, acknowledging that what's safe and what's risky changes through your life. That to me is a really important part of the conversation to be had in the setting of the system. Thank you again for allowing me to make some opening remarks. Thank you. Michael, thank you. And I, I do appreciate that um, you hit the KPI we set this afternoon and with a one minute efficiency dividend for all. <laughs> thank so, you. For that, thank you. so for that, we're grateful. But, but also thank you from the Commission because you have been on this journey with us. We have met with you several times. We have benefited from your submissions. Thank you. Um, and particularly as we sort of grappled with get, getting the methodology right for our own portfolio benchmark work, for our, the way we've constructed investment performance series over times, um, but also as we grapple with the, um, the, the murky world of life cycle products. Sure, sure. Um, so probably three things that would be helpful for us to run through with you this afternoon. Firstly, our best in show criteria. What should the expert panel take into account? I don't know if you've had a chance to to look at that part of our report where we set out a page which is kind of like high level principles of what areas would we want the best in show expert panel to go to? Um, I, I think this is an industry, as you know, that's sort of gone from troubled teenager to young, young adult. <laughs> and we're now sort of, you know, 20, 25 years into this journey. And I think what's important in terms of setting up success now is bringing together something that really was a shoebox of cash. Collection, we have a world class accumulation system. Now we're demanding a maturity from this system that it actually morphs into a world-class retirement income system. And I think to me that's the nub of the idea, that things that need to be on, I think, for consideration are how do we best set up a set of criteria that are meaningful to folks, that are aligned to the objectives of superannuation. Our research has shown that um, there is a real risk in doing anything in a deterministic way in this business. I know at the moment some of the excitement is about target date funds and the sort of static glide path and the way you draw the line and the line of descent. As you saw in the US, and you know um, I was in the US um, giving testimony to the SEC and Department of Labor hearings on this very matter. Part of the challenge with that sort of design principle, it's sort of when you think about landing a plane safely, you line it up with a runway at an angle of three degrees. But the pilot knows there's wind shears and atmospheric conditions that require you to make those adjustments. And we put a lot of, a lot of, a lot of faith and trust in the pilots and their training and the instrumentation to do that. We don't just simply blindly land the plane at an angle of three degrees. 
And to me, this is the next generation of life cycle. The idea of life cycle is robust. There are Nobel Prize winners who absolutely support this idea. And going back to this idea of what's safe and what's risky changes through your life, I think we've got to be very careful about uh, enshrining deterministic approaches. Uh, so that would be the first thing. Once you buy that as an approach, everything is, dare I say, it's solvable from there. Things like probability of falling short of the target. Um, evaluating success criteria that have a meaningfulness to households, to mums and dads. Now, isn't it amazing? My, my mother's a hairdresser, my stepfather was a Woolies manager. When I talk to them about standard deviations and glide putt, their eyes just glaze over. But when you talk to them about um, replacing income levels or weekly spend, and, and we have mathematical terms for those, engagement is, is a lot easier. Mm. So I, I suppose that, sorry, that's a very long answer. Nudging, if you will, not just the, um, the, the behavioural finance, using behavioural finance to nudge the criteria to a more outcome-oriented frame of success. Yeah. So I guess there's, there's two decisions we're looking for folk to make. Firstly, the, the, the best in show expert panel sure. deciding who are the best in show mm. funds mm. with good default products. Yeah. And we've identified, we haven't been prescriptive or deterministic there. Sure. That is, we want to make sure that we've got the thematic buckets right yeah. and we might provide a bit more guidance under that. So it's things like long-term investment track record, um, governance, yep. um, and governance we get into, you know, do you have the right board, the trustee board and the right investment committee with the right skills matrices, um, investment strategy, product innovation in um, accumulation, transition and retirement, knowing the member base, the cohort, what data do you have on them that informs that product innovation, and then how you go about member engagement and have you got value for money insurance. So there are sort of bucket headings. Are there any other bucket heading, headings we should have for the expert panel on the best in show? Uh, perhaps it, 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 you've, you've, you've danced around this, but actually it sort of goes back to my remarks about the system becoming more mature, actually bringing together the asset problem with the liability problem and bringing those two domains together. So, so that would be under your two things and your investment strategy and then also your product innovation. Sure, okay. sure. And then the beauty of that, of course, is that engagement becomes a lot simpler. Perhaps the thing I would challenge about some of the conversation you've had over the last three days is that these things are solvable. Now, they're mathematically complex. You need to have the stochastics and, dare I say, it, a few propeller heads who <laughs> like this sort of stuff, but we can bring them out of dark rooms and occasionally to Oh, help we've got ours in well-lit rooms. <laughs> oh, well, well, the Productivity Commission, of course, is a uh, dynamic um, leading uh, organisation, I understand that. <clears throat> At university, no, no. My substantive point is this, is that we can actually have a debate now where it, beliefs, if you will, or strong opinions can be tested in a cogent framework. The technology now exists that if the expert panel is guided and the debate is had on what <coughs> those priorities are, our, us, others, we've shared this, these citations with you, mm. there's now technology where you can actually put that through, if you will, a sausage machine, all the strategies through a sausage machine and come up with these sorts of criteria. But they're not deterministic. That they're, Unfortunately, they're not straight lines mm. and... 81.27%. They are more about putting the balance of probabilities in favour of, of the member. Yep. And I guess that's what Best in Show is really about at the sure. end of the day. It'll be judgment by the expert panel, yeah. but at least it's yeah. transparent uh, judgment and it's subject yeah. to scrutiny and revisit every four years. Th that's one part of the decision yeah. making that matters. The other one is, is about the member themselves mm. with a modicum of interest and potentially engagement. The role of the dashboard, yeah. we... We did have some commentary around that in terms of um, it seems to have been a not so dashing dashboard has eventuated, <laughs> sure. um, thus that it, it, it does, indeed we've heard from some of the um, uh, behavioural finance, behavioural economists at some of the other uh, academic institutions that have tested these dashboards yeah. on real live members and they sort of got a fail mark. Um, so we've, again, not been deterministic but say that the regulator now needs to be proactive um, consult with technical experts and do behavioural economics informed consumer testing on a one page dashboard that means that a member could make sort of a meaningful choice. So your hairdresser or your um, 
you know, the, the, manager. the Woolies manager <laughs> of the yeah. world could actually look at a dashboard and, and understand something on it and sort of think, well, I like what this fund's doing a bit more than this one. Um, I have the great pleasure of having a link with Defined Contribution Institutional Investors Association in the US. I'm on their research centre board. And I'm happy to share with you and maybe make some contacts, but their kind of work is showing, similar to what you've been hearing in the last few days, simpler is better. Um, things like a stack of coins and where you are against a stack of coins is immediately engaging. Um, studies in the US that show that during the global financial crisis, if we presented an asset framed outcome where the asset portfolio fell, the, the people receiving went, oh, my, my balance has fallen and they switched to cash at the wrong time versus the sort of the, uh, the trial group that had an income projection very simply done and saw that when their future self, their future income was falling, they actually had a nudge to put more in. So I actually think there are some really nice things that are happening around mm. the world that don't require huge complexity, but are extremely powerful with the nudge. So maybe I'm a slightly more, I'm an economist on a Friday afternoon being slightly more optimistic, but I am. Um, I'm slightly more optimistic on how, and there's great work that industry folks are doing that can share with you that wearing some other hats that I get to see, which you know use wonderful things like little speedometers and things mm -hmm. like that, that are incredibly engaging and cut through all of that sort of complexity into things that people could sort of have a um, have an engagement with, and, and immediately sort of cause to, to act. Yeah. Well, well, we are anything but public policy <laughs> optimists at the commission. Sure. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing the day job. <laughs> sure. um, indeed, we wouldn't have had the draft recommendations we did. But, but I guess again, we're not going to be too prescriptive and deterministic. No. It's just saying that the regulator should do this, yep. consulting with the right people, yep. and so as a process yep. for our recommendation, that sounds about right. For and and look, the wonderful thing about what you're proposing is that. The behavioural finance leads naturally to a liability-based conversation. It leads naturally to an outcome. In, you know, so this isn't something kind of over there. You are actually, perhaps for the first time, aligning why are we doing this superannuation thing in this country? How are we marshalling this? You know, and, and we're leading to an outcome. That, that kind of sounds like yeah. a, a good work, if I could put it that way. Yeah. And look, we can leverage a little bit earlier on some of the early inquiry participant feedback we had, given that you do work with QSuper and we've heard from the CIO of QSuper. Um, but in terms of what you see across the industry, um, will most funds that are in the sort of my super default space have the data and the internal capability to be able to, to come up with a life cycle product that's going to be a smart life cycle product that will be in members' best interests versus some of the simpler life mm. cycle products that we've seen, we've done stochastic modelling about that don't look like they're in the best interests of members. And, and we, we are obviously are on the public record finding similar, similar results. Um, I'd say this, the wonderful thing about this conversation is not actually about smart life cycle or smart balanced or smart target date funds. It's actually maybe for the first time moving to the responsible adult, if I could use that, overwork that metaphor a little bit where outcomes are central to success, where the acknowledgement, and, and you, you, you have seen ours and, and the work of others on sequencing risk and path dependency, where those sorts of issues really are material um, to members. And so I, I suppose for me, things like flags around um, balance, so where you are in your life stage, and thinking about sequencing risk becoming more important when the largest amount of money's at risk. And actually, when you move into the retirement phase, the importance of sequencing risk actually declines mm. because money-weighted returns are no longer as important as they were when the money's at its zenith. So I, I think you might be pleasantly surprised to know that even that as a first step, and our research, the research of others, some of the folks who've been, uh, you've, you've, you've had testimony from, Malevsky, a whole range of authors around the world would support that. The fact that you've actually added something as simple as a money-weighted outcome improves outcomes dramatically. It's almost like the first step. Then I think as others have said over the last three days, gender, we've written on that. I think gender in a way now is so important that it's, 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 it's joining a, a larger issue around the underemployment of Australians, the casualisation of the labour market, 
all of those worrying statistics that say how few people under the age of 25 are in full-time employment. So I could see, you know, this, this, there has to be a system now that can handle different cash flow profiles at different parts of the life stage that's clear on the North Star, if you will, to use that metaphor, is clear on the objective. So, so we can talk about a best in show in an expert panel making mm. and a judgment call about who is best in show in an aspirational sense about yep. getting product design right for the member. Yep. We're also dealing with the reality that if, if, based on our analysis and evidence, there is a whole bunch of life cycle products that are inappropriate for members at play today, right. yep. um, how do we deal with those? Because we've got member harm occurring now um, and while aspirations through a best in show lead mm. innovation leadership sounds pretty good to us as well, that takes time for that to trickle yeah. through. And there's a, a large mm. number of members, 30% of my super products are life cycle products. And, um, and I don't want to compound the problem for you, but if we were having this meeting in Washington this afternoon, you know the vast majority of defaults in the US mm. now are life cycle yeah. funds. And they have the you know, qualified default investment alternative safe harbour for fiduciary. So my, certainly I would answer the question this way. Um, I think in a way we're getting excited about a debate on life cycle. I have lived through investment markets where if the volatility and your near retirement is very high, you would like obviously less growth based, at, particularly if you need to draw on it in a short period of time. Life cycle actually comes up okay, but that's the point in time risk that you mentioned. Versus that, a 70 30 or an 80 20 or 100, whatever it might be. That's again another version of a straight line. So I actually probably would be, I'd probably frame your question, if you don't mind, uh, Commissioner, uh, which is always a risk in reframing the Commissioner's <laughs> question, um, slightly differently. And again, have a set of evaluative criteria through which an evidence base can be presented. We, we can do that. Well, we, we can do that for best in show. What I'm struggling with is right. if, if we make a call that there's a large number of life cycle products at the moment that are inappropriate, and given the basis of the stochastic mm. analysis that was presented in our report, that seems to be the case, we can't allow that to continue in a default sure. segment. Sure, but, but can you allow the 70-30 to continue if you don't think that's... I, I suppose my question here is... So, so maybe, yeah. maybe the... Maybe yeah. the the easiest way then yep. is, is, is an envelope solution, and that is if we have a tail of underperforming funds mm. where over a period of time their net investment returns have been systemically lower, we lop off that tail through a elevated my super authorization. Perhaps the good funds that are left are those that will quickly work out how to get themselves to better life cycle products. Uh, can I give you some confidence? Um, I've been in this game a little while, and everyone I meet in this industry is literal. If, if, you, if, if the Commission and the regulations are very clear on what success looks like, people are pretty literal. They'll, they will literally engineer um, to, to meet that, that hurdle. I, I think in a way, I'm slightly more optimistic in that we, we are on this journey. Um, you know, we remember sort of the 70-30 funds. We saw the linking of the first time of target date funds and life cycle with life cycle theory, which is absolutely appropriate for what we are talking about this afternoon. The, the problem is though, is that target date funds are, are just so elegant in terms of their simplicity, that they're actually dangerously complex. You're sort of drawing a line today where you think you know what will happen to the asset allocation in the next 25 years. That, that, that's a big call. Um, so I, I suppose I would, I would perhaps put it more constructively that life cycle, target date, dynamic life cycle and innovations we haven't talked about yet um, really need to be considered through the lens of the life stage. I believe they need to be the default. I think this is now so important and so challenging that they need the best minds and the best thinking and the best innovation in the country focused on this. While we're in the world of default, mm. default retirement products. You're right. Um, I think we have sometimes in this industry um, the Swedish driver problem. Um, everyone wants to be above average or thinks they're above average. And I know as a professor, um, I have yet to have a graduate student come up to me and say, Professor Drew, I'm a below average student. Um, why did I get this mark on my... <laughs> Everyone's above average. So I think 
the debate has actually moved on from that. I think there is the green shoots of a very important debate here and offshore about incorporating dynamism into the design of the default. That we've, you know, in my lifetime, 87 crash, Asian financial crisis, Russian default, 9-11 and all the tragedy that went with that, tech wreck, you know, we go through the list. We seem to have things that happen in markets that should not happen every three or four years. So the more I'm in this game, the more I'm sort of less believing of normal probabilities and normal distributions. The reason I'm sharing this with you is I think at times we are trying too hard to solve too many problems with one asset allocation. We can get into some really silly debates. Take the default, don't de-risk it too much for our 25-year-olds, but hang on, you need to land at safety for our 60-year-olds. Uh, we want to be top quartile, bottom quartile, feet. like we, we kind of set these things up and the more layers and the more we add, the impossibility of achieving it is, it is impossible. So I think to me there are some nubs of insight that life cycle bring to the debate. Cohort, uh, gender that's been mentioned, account balance is really important. There are some people whose account balances are such that success can be managed today and they have, you know, pick a number, 15 times their final salary and they've replaced 80% of their pre you know, who don't need to take any risk and just live off the, the earnings. But there's a very important rump that we need to, I think, as fiduciaries focus on, that, you know, are in this sort of zone of, they're going to need some age pension, but we're going to have to have designs which aren't just investment-based defaults, but defaults on insurance, as you've mentioned, to take away some kinds of risk. Dare I say it, we don't talk about inflation anymore, but I, I remember as a kid there was this thing called inflation. I wonder if we need to start talking about that at some stage again. Uh, the, the public pension and the interplay between those levers. So I think of best practice default design as being holistic. It thinks about adequacy as distinct from longevity. It thinks about sequencing as distinct from ruin. And I think that's where this committee and the way you're framing this debate, and as, as others have said today, importantly, it's step one in a journey. Life cycle is an important first step. The cohort idea, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a simple brilliance about that, but it's more complex than that. The individual features need to come to bear. So, Michael, are you involved or providing any um, submissions or feedback to Treasury in their consultation on the SIPA? We, we have, yes, we have. And what's your thinking there in terms of the direction that Treasury is taking that in? I know within our, our understanding, we're still looking at it, is that it's meant to be dynamic within, in terms of the sure. buckets that are within the yeah. SIPA product and what members would have what dial up or dial down in those buckets. The biggest issue we face is two retirement versus three retirement. So this is a, and I, I'm sorry, I know your job is very complex as it is now, but it, I think the Productivity Commission and colleagues at Treasury need to get as one voice on this sort of stuff. Because you can, you can set up a fantastic system that engineers to the retirement date. But as we all know, people are living longer, women are living much, much longer, you know, there's a through debate that has to be had as well. So if, if you're designing defaults, you actually can, the sequencing risk goes up because you've got this hard date that you're trying to manage to. Where if you have the opportunity to have clarity around the through debate, you make some very, very different decisions. So I suppose that's the, the first one. The second one which um, uh, Brad and others have alluded to is w we are still a bit silver bullet in our thinking on SIPAs as, as, as they stand today. From, from my perspective, that we seem to be searching um, in the Navy term for the golden rivet, the thing that's going to hold it all together. There must be one of these things, right, that does that. I, I wonder whether or not it's a lot harder than that because um, as we... I'm in the dynamic camp, so I think about um, mortality updating as you age. So, you know, mortality updating of life expectancy is important. Um, quality of life, active epoch in retirement versus more passive epoch in retirement. Um, age care, accommodation bonds, um, health shocks. We've written on these things. 
And some of these things fit very neatly to a market-based solution, and some of these problems actually fit very neatly to a uh, balance sheet-based solution. So unfortunately, I'm very much in the both and camp on this stuff, that um, these things can be very important if we <coughs> grab the top five risks in retirement. I would suggest three of them are probably market, can be held, handled in a market-based way, but a couple of them, um, maybe like annuities and deferred annuities, some of that sort of stuff, or mortality credits and things like that, dare I say it at a productivity commission, <coughs> tontine, um, sorry, we, there's, there's, there's nicer dinner party words for tontine, but <coughs> some of these things are going to require good governance, good fiduciary practice, and a unified framework at a regulatory level that can help folks in retirement manage very different risks with very different horizons. Okay. So, sorry, I think there was one. Oh, we do. Okay. <laughs> plan. It's all so, right. so take out is SIPA ain't simple, and it's not going to be one size fits all. There's a whole bunch of other. Okay. But, 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 but please celebrate a both and, you know, both and not either or, but a both and solution. That that's our, that's all of our research points to that, um, and we're happy to share that with you okay. if it's of interest. I did find the golden visit analogy a good one. So <laughs> okay. I, I thank you very much for that. We'll probably quote that in the report, I think. Karen loves analogies. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Especially when they're not mine. <laughs> it's mine that makes sense. All righty. Um, Michael, thank you so much. I'm sure we could have spoken for a lot longer, but um, um, I'll have a commission. <laughs> commissioner, a commissioner sitting next to me is going to kill me if she misses her flight, no, as will her sorry. husband and two children. Um, so thank you very much. Folks. Thank you. That's it. We have completed our <laughs> oh so super super hearings um, um, and uh, we look forward to doing some further consultation, post draft reports and I think we've now added probably one, one or two more technical roundtables to what we offer to do in our draft report. And thank you linesmen, thank you ball boys. We're finished for the day. Have a good weekend all. <laughs>